Father, we thank you that you're the God that blesses. And hallelujah. That men curse, and they bring a curse upon themselves, but you would bless her. Hallelujah. And we pray, oh God, that your people will step into the blessing tonight. They step into the blessing. The blessing of, of the Holy Ghost, rivers from on high. Oh, Rabba Basataya. Now what you have to recognize is that if you don't step into what Father has for you and the goodness of what Father has for you, you just basically are sitting there just vulnerable to all that the enemy is going to do. Because the only way that you and I could be kept from lies and deceit is to be filled up with truth. And so the Holy Spirit would fill us with His truth. He, but he says he, we, he doesn't force it. He says, be filled. Hallelujah. And when you're filled with joy, you're filled with his truth. And when you're filled with his peace, you're filled with his truth. And when you're filled with his love, you're filled with his truth. And when you're filled with his working, you're filled with his truth. Now, if you're sitting around sad and sorrowful and upset and don't know what it means and feel distant from God, the scripture says only your sin can separate you between, separate you between God. Separate you from God but the blood of Jesus has come to remove the sin so in on honesty and truth and sincerity of heart if you take the blood of Jesus Christ and you say Lord cleanse me from my sin forgive me of my sin I want nothing to do with sin in my life then there is no separation is removed so then immediately instantaneously you should feel the floodgates of heaven burst forth upon your soul because then that's the witness God the Holy Ghost gives a witness, and you want that witness. The Spirit of truth will bear witness with your spirit, because the Holy Ghost will fill your spirit with joy. You know where joy comes from? Your spirit. Same place that love and peace comes from. Same place that life comes from. And the Holy Ghost will fill your spirit with the things of heaven. And then you know what's going to be the next benefactor? Your face. Your face. Your face will get to relax and smile. It takes more muscles to frown. Actually, it is a strain to frown. It is a strain. Physiologically, a strain to frown. It's terrible, man. We live under such a stress. And the Lord just wants to deliver us tonight. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 You know, you always feel welcome when you walk into a room full of smiling faces. You know that? You don't feel very welcome if you walk into a room full of glares and stares and frowns. I believe the Holy Spirit feels the same way about it. He feels real welcomed when he walks into a room with smiling faces. He's like, okay, I belong here. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for bringing us into your presence. Thank you, Father, for filling us with the new wine of heaven. <laughs> Thank you, God, for filling us with the rivers of your divine pleasure and of glory. Thank you, living God. Thank you, living God. Blessed and holy is your name. 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 Hallelujah. 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 <laughs> Blessed and holy is your name. Hallelujah. Ma, 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 na, Happy are the people who know the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> Blessed is the name of the Lord Jesus. Blessed is the name of the Lord Jesus. I don't know why you just don't enjoy doing that for a long time. I, I have a hard time quitting. I usually stop just so I can try to minister to people why they ought to do it more. That's usually all I'm doing. I stop just tell people why they ought to be so filled with the glory of God that they find the life of the overcomer. That's the only reason I stop and preach. Otherwise, I just stand up here and worship God all night. Ha! <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 
one of the mighty men that the Lord raised up in our generation who just really God used him to help launch the church and understanding how to flow in the Holy Ghost. Um, we were hosting him one night and um, I guess we must have worshipped for about an hour, hour and a half. And, and he said, you know what? He said, we're done now. I mean, we there in that realm, we're in that glory realm. And so, and it was like everybody in the place was partic had participated. It was beautiful, beautiful move of God. So there was nothing to do but just stand there in His presence and praise Him. Because, I mean, the, all preaching is, is about getting you into the anointing. All preaching is about is getting you healed, getting you saved, getting you filled. Huh? And so if you get healed, saved, and filled, my goodness, just stand and worship then. So we just take a break just so that everybody knows how to come into to the presence. We stop and we preach to help people understand, well, because there are things that hold people back. There are things that keep people from connecting. They say, why can't I connect? And then they're just stuck. Why is it that I'm not moving forward in God? Why isn't it that I'm not maturing? Why isn't it that those compassions of God and the brokenness of Jesus doesn't overwhelm me? Because that just, that's not something we produce out of, out of the human realm, out of our own self. It's something that flows to us and supplied to us from heaven. And so we just take the Word of God by the Spirit. We begin to minister the Word of God by the Spirit so that people can understand what's blocking their way, what's hindering them, what troop is standing before them, what walls are too high, as it were, keeping them away from all that Father has supplied, what areas of their life they've not been willing to, to, to just surrender and consecrate to the Lord. And, you know, usually all these things, at some point in time, the Lord pointed his put his finger on it but you know what? He could have put his finger on the problem, and that night you were just mad and upset. Huh? Or he could have put the finger on the problem, and that night you got mad and upset right after you left the meeting. And then you forgot. Huh? And, and so what we want to do is we want to just, we want to be really sensitive to the Holy Spirit. We, you know, that's why the Lord says you must be converted and become like a little child. Otherwise, you can't come into the kingdom. And there are the, there are the signs of, the, of those who are converted as, those, as well as the signs of the believer. And we just want to be that way. We, we want to be very simple and very obedient. We want to be very easily instructed and so hungry to know that we don't forget. You know? People that aren't hungry to know. I mean, I'm telling you right now, I've been a teacher of the Word. I've been, I've been, and, and, and been used of the Lord in, in other areas of, of life, like managing folks and whatnot in business. And I, it just takes a lot of a time sometimes to instruct a person in what to do. And Father's got all the long-suffering and patience and mercy to do it. But I've discovered that when you really want to know, when you're really hungry, when you're really passionate, the Lord gives us the capacity to get it the first time and will give us 100% recall. Now, now, having said that, getting involved in the cares of this life and the deceitfulness of riches will dull you. You'll start getting, you'll start getting uh, memory loss. The disease of short-term memory and the things of the Spirit will set in. These things are true. Most everything that happens to you in the realms of the physical, actually, just a reflection of what's going on in the spiritual. And so, you know, we tonight we're just standing here. All of us just standing here. I'm, I'm, and I hope I'm more hungry than anybody else. I hope that you can understand. I just, I really want the things of the spirit to be fully manifested in my life. I'm not interested in just having some status quo Christianity. I'm not interested in just somehow measuring up to whatever it is that wherever the bar is set right now, as it were in our generation, in terms of who knows God and who doesn't, or who walks in the Spirit, or who has signs, wonders, and miracles. I'm just really desperate about knowing Him. About I'm, I'm just desperate about entering into that realm that is made available for us that we see in the Old Testament people did it Enoch did it Elijah did it these guys stand out to me Moses did it Enoch and Elijah and Moses are three characters that stand out to me huge there's actually five for me that are, stand out to me in a, in, a, in a dramatic way 
They're Enoch, they're Elijah. It's, there's Moses, Samuel, and Daniel, those five. And of course, the Lord brings one other in emphasis uh, when he's talking about, you know, those who stood before him and made huge impact, and he brings Job into it. Now, I know there's, we could talk about so many different people. We could talk about Jacob and Abraham. We could talk about J uh, Joshua. But there's something very unique about Enoch and Elijah. That's why they're alive right now, standing before the throne of God. Something unique about them. Something very unique about Moses. When a man can commune with God, his man speaks to man. Huh? I personally am interested in it. For me, these aren't just a bunch of stories about Bible characters. This is a testimony of another realm that you can enter into. Because God, who's out without respect to persons, what he's given to one, he's made available to another. He doesn't have partiality or preferences. He just... What happens is Enoch's just showing, hey, he's saying, saying to us, hey, guy, there's, hey, guys, there's an amazing place to live if you want to come over here. That's all Elijah's saying. That's all that Moses is saying. That's all that Samuel is saying. Whew. Daniel. You know, you can find your five foremost characters. You're with me. But the Lord said, though Samuel or Daniel is standing here, or Job, I mean, uh, yeah, Job or or Elijah was standing here. Or, you know, he's got various different characters that have preeminence, as it were, in the realm of manifesting his glory. Having walked with him in such a way. Oh, my, my. Just, just think, consider that we could step into a greater realm tonight of interacting with him. Huh? Did you know that knowing God was a result of interacting with him, not studying about him? It's true. It's true. See, Israel studied about God. They read the book. Moses interacted with God, so he knew him. Huh? It's really the difference. It's really the difference. And, you know, when you begin to understand what Father really values, he values a broken, contrite heart. He, 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 he values meekness and humility. He values these things. He, he, he despises and, 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 and pride disgusts him. Pride among the realms of men are very valuable. They say, wow, look at this guy. He's, you know, he's strong. You know. Well, it's rejected by the Father. So then when we begin to understand these basic principles about God, we can say, okay, well, you know what? I want to interact with Father. I want to have these dispositions in my life. I don't want to be, I don't come in walking in on him and be all offensive. You know what I'm saying? And then when we recognize that in our inability and in our inadequacy, and in our weakness, we get to come with the blood of Jesus. We get to stand there like, you know, with Jesus. Saying, I'm with him. I'm in him. I've come in here with him. You know. If you go into some, if you go into the president's office. Or you go into the prime minister's office or the king's office. And you weren't invited in. You're going to have to go in with somebody that was. And they're going to have to be, you're going to have to be able to say, oh, I'm with them. And they're going to have to turn and look at you and go, yeah, that's right. He's with me. Otherwise, you're in trouble. <laughs> huh? Oh, Baba Sitere. Tonight, we're with Jesus. Tonight. Tonight, you're with Jesus. Tonight, you're with Jesus. And the beautiful thing of it is, is we're always going to be with him. But he's Father, and we always come by him and, and through him. And we have this access by the blood of Jesus Christ and by the Holy Spirit. But Father has got this place of of maturation that he wants to bring us into as we come and encounter him, as we walk into his presence, so that he can use us more, so that he can, so that he can manifest his life through us, so that in that encounter uh, of knowing him, there is a showing forth of his person and presence, a showing forth of his glory. Ha ha! Ha ha ha! And a showing forth of his power. Huh? I'm going to tell you right now, when Naaman came to get cleansed, he might have been a bit arrogant to start with. But as soon as he was cleansed, he said, there is no God except for the God that belongs to Israel. He said, from this day forward. I mean, come on. Nebuchadnezzar, in his haughtiness and his pride, you can go through the history of, of men who had an encounter with God, who knew God. And they was able to make him known because they knew him. When you know him, you're able to make him known. 
we're able to make him known on the basis of what we know him and of how we know him and and maybe that testimony is just simply look I once was lost but now I'm found I, I once had I once was in darkness but now I'm in in his, in, in his love I, I once had just at sorrow and sadness and anger and madness and now I've got love and joy and peace and gladness I mean whatever you know that maybe that's it but that is a powerful in itself that's a powerful testimony however father wants to take it to a place where these works and greater works Whew. hallelujah now that doesn't excite some people some people get upset if you start talking about greater works that's false doctrine but for me I get excited and it isn't about anything other than just you know I love to be I love to be classified as being with Jesus not with the other folks I want to be classified as being with Jesus. Somebody said, why do you like miracles so much? Because Jesus does them. Huh? Why do you like healing so much? Because that's what Jesus does. Amen. He's the miracle worker. He's the healer. Hallelujah. Why do you like the manifest power of God? Because that's what Jesus wants. That's what he does. That's what he likes. That's what he is. And, I, and I'm in love with Jesus. And, and, and I want him. I have bound myself to, to live in him and by him and not live my own life, but to live his life. And that's the life that he has shown us very clearly. That's the life he's told us to come and join ourselves unto and to follow. Hallelujah. And I have found the simplicity of it all developed within this place of praise. We're getting ready to do some praise. And for me, praise is something that uh, is, is the deepest place of intimacy of my spirit and of my soul. I don't like casual worship. I don't like, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a hard, I have a hard time singing the same song twice. I have a hard time praying the same prayer twice. I don't mind singing the scripture more and over and then over again. I don't mind praying the scripture over and over again. Huh? But I don't want to sing something just for singing's sake. Because why? Otherwise, I'm going to have a falsehood in my spirit. I'm going to be at the very fundamental heart and place in which God develops me for a greater encounter and interaction with Him, and I'm doing something that's not really deep inside. It's not coming out of here. It's not coming out of this depth. And what I want more than anything else, what I need and what I desire, more than, it's just coming out of a place of, you know, the head, you know, the the, you know, the, the memory, the, the casual. That's probably the best way to describe it. Intimacy doesn't come out of the casual. Everybody knows that. Everybody knows that, right? Yeah, yeah everybody knows. Well, your wife knows that. <laughs> Guys, whether you know that or not, your wife, ask your wife. She'll tell you when you get home. Takes guys longer. Are you with me? Intimacy doesn't come out of the casual. Huh? It comes out of something so passionate, so unique, and so intense, and so personal, and so important. Jesus. And so if, as you begin to, as you begin to interact with Him, and it's not just something coming out of your head you got to do, okay? It's time to prayer and pray and so we go to pray but it's a call to prayer God the Holy Ghost called you there it's going on inside you and you feel his presence and so you're enjoying his presence as you interact with him I see it's a different realm it's a totally different realm there's nothing awkward about it you with me how many people know awkward we all know awkward right Awkward is usually when you're doing something you don't feel real comfortable with and everybody's staring at you, right? Man, but I'm telling you, when you begin to interact with the Lord, <laughs> you know, everybody disappears. Just everybody disappears. Everybody just disappears. And just, it's just a beautiful, wonderful thing. I just... We just want everyone to come to know this beautiful, wonderful thing of interacting with the living God. This beautiful, wonderful thing of growing and being developed in His presence. Being filled with the Spirit. Filled, in other words, 
literally with an overwhelming peace and overwhelming joy and overwhelming love. It's not, it's not an abstract, esoteric concept. Like covalent bonds. It's something very practical and real. Mm. Kila masada na ikesia. Meaningful. To be filled with the Spirit is something very practical and meaningful. And because you sense it. Peace, joy, love, goodness, authority, boldness, confidence, assurance, faith. He just takes it in all different kinds of directions. Great compassion. Great mercy. He takes it in all kinds of different directions. But there's nothing so wonderful as the kind of love that only the Holy Ghost gives where you just love everybody around. Where all of a sudden, all the offenses and all the problems and all the issues go away. I told the Lord, I said, Lord, I want to grow this next year by being able to love people in the first five minutes, just like you love them. I want to be able to love them in the first five minutes. Not have to go through whatever, you know, investigative studies, <laughs> forensic testing, you know, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Background checks, due diligence, and then decide. Father just loves us. He just loves us, and he calls us to repentance. And just because God so loved the world doesn't mean that he knows anybody in it, because until that person will respond to him, there is no love of relationship. So that's why coming into this love is the most important thing, because it ultimately causes us and allows us and empowers us to engage in a fellowship that otherwise is not humanly possible. You'll have to do your due diligence, forensics, investigation, then decide whether it works out or not. And then if it's good, then it goes on for a little while and it blows up inside of five years. Or it gets bad most of the time. In some period of... Forget about all that. How about let's get to practical, real, genuine, no more make-believe, confined to religion encounters with the spirit of the living God if you don't have these things tonight all you have to do is ask the Lord you just, and it, you just begin to say Holy Spirit fill me with your love and he'll fill, fill you somebody said how is it that you love people in that situation where they're doing something wrong to you or, or where you're having to remember the offense just say Holy Spirit fill me with your love and what happens is an interaction begins to take place between you and God because you're like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to behave myself inappropriately. I'm going to walk circumspect. I'm going to walk correctly. I'm going to walk according as Father has dictated. Doesn't matter. I'm going to do what He said to do. And when that ultimately is seen in your life, and is seen in a way in which Father says, "This is real. This is consistent. This is their will." This is what they want to do. Then you're going to find a place in God where every time you ask, immediately filled. Every time you ask, immediately answered. There are things that I ask Father for that are delayed. I have to wait for them. Why? Because there's things got to be proven. There, Father, and, and, and it's, that's Father's prerogative to prove things. I don't understand all the dimensions of why things need to be proven and established, but it's true. And sometimes that's why healings are delayed. That's why walking in gifts of the Spirit are delayed or other things are delayed. But I'm going to tell you right now, you just grab a hold of God. You believe what He said. You, you take it as yours it's, because it is yours. And you behave yourself properly. And you watch what happens to you. Hallelujah. Boy, you, you step into every good thing. You think about the fruits of the Spirit that Father has given us. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering. When you think about the things that belong to gentleness and then you go to the faith and the goodness the meekness and the temperance if you just stop for a second and said what would it be like to be continually filled all day with goodness to where I just feel good you wake up in the morning ooh I feel good when's the last time you woke up in the morning and you said I feel good huh when was the last time for me it was this morning but I mean <coughs> you know I don't know when the last time you were woke up in the morning, I felt good. But that was supplied to me by the Holy Spirit. And so if you're not, look at, you know, I don't know. Some of you are looking at me sad. 
So if you're not waking up in the morning feeling really good, ask the Holy Spirit to steal you. Because this is what the Lord says. He says this. He says for us to redeem the days. Redeem the time for the day is evil. And how we do that? Be filled with spirit. Uh-huh. And when you get filled with spirit, what happens? You get filled with goodness. So guess what's going to do? What's going to happen? You're going to feel goodness. Huh? Oh, I'm filled with the Spirit. So said sour face. Sour face doesn't know what it means to be filled with the Spirit. Uh, I, I'm filled with the Spirit, said sadness of heart. But sadness of heart really never knew what it meant to be filled with the Spirit. Huh? And so what we want to do is we want to make sure that people clearly understand what God is going to do when He does it. Otherwise, you're going to be deceived. You know what I'm saying? If, you, if it's just arbitrary and abstract and esoteric and who knows what's going to happen, <laughs> you know, you're going to equate wrong things with the Holy Ghost. I'm feeling terrible. God, the Holy Ghost is on me. Ah! You know, that would be terribly wrong, right? I feel like murdering somebody. God, the Holy Ghost has filled me. What? That would be terribly wrong. Okay? And those are extremes, Right? So the Holy Ghost tells us in His Word, this is what I'm doing. <laughs> when I'm filling you and you're being filled, this is what's going on. Huh? That's why saying Jesus Christ is Lord is the spirit of prophecy. The Lord's just telling us, this is what's going to be coming out of us when we're being moved. There's a lordship. He's my master. Proclamation of who He is. Because there's something that happens when a person anointed of the Holy Ghost begins to tell others that Jesus Christ is Lord. Huh? I've got to, I have been able, I've been privileged to watch it on the mass scale in un, uh, unreached people group nations. When I, by the anointing of the Holy Ghost, begin to tell people that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is the only true and living God. And watch the power of God strike thousands of, multitudes and multitudes, thousands and thousands of people all at once. And then, of course, we are privileged in the context of the United States of America. Hopefully, we are privileged to have those experience on a, on a one-to-one basis. We begin to proclaim who Jesus Christ is by the anointing, not out of the intellect, not out of a religious creed, but by the Spirit of the Lord. Because Father doesn't even want us giving witness without the Holy Ghost. Did you know that? He said, go wait. He said, yeah. he said go wait in Jerusalem. <laughs> Guys, you're going to be my witnesses. But first, go wait. You're going to go in all the world and preach the gospel. But first... You go wait until you're endued with power from on high. Then, then, then you can give witness to me. Then you can testify to me. And literally, you can be proof providers. And literally, you can have exchange of life. Because the martyr is to give your life up for another life. Our life was given up for another. That's martyrus, witness. Our life was given up for another life, Christ Jesus' life. Ooh, hallelujah. <laughs> hallelujah. And this, the beautiful thing is this is Papa's will. This is what he wants. This isn't our idea. What if we said, okay, Father, please, this, i got this great idea. Would you please go with me on this? I want you to be manifested through my life. And we're trying to talk God into it. That would be a different situation altogether. However, he's pleading with us, let me live through you. Let me be revealed through you. Hallelujah. So all we got to do is let. Huh? All we got to do is allow. All we now, now, I will admit, I do admit, there is a challenge here. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you the responsibility I'm laid on you. You must deny yourself. Because yourself is going to say this thing and that thing and believe this and believe that and want to do this and want to do that and feel it's okay. And the Lord's going to say no. You just say no to that. You say no. And this is where we're all growing. We're all growing here. We're growing and maturing and saying no to that. No to frustration. Huh? No to stress. Huh? No to, no to retaliation. Huh? No to the lust of the flesh or the pride of life. Those things hit you all right, left, center, don't they? Bang, 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 bang. Huh? How are you going to deal with it? Filled with the Spirit. Being filled with the Spirit. Then the Lord gives us the capacity to say, you know what, I'm, I'm just not going there. I'm not doing that. 
Huh? You got so you got plenty. You're plenty. Huh? Somebody comes to your doorstep and they're gonna be selling groceries. They're selling groceries. And you your all your cupboards are full. Your 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 pantry's full. The garage is full. Both refrigerators and freezers jam packed. You're just gonna have to say sorry. You may have something very good there, but I have no room. We're filled up. Huh? There's just no interest. You know what I'm saying? And when it comes to the devil propagating his lies and goods, I should say the devil propagating, propagating his lies and bads, as opposed to goods, is not, not interested. Not interested. In fact, it's grieving me. I'm feeling ter- more terrible the longer I have to listen to this nonsense kind of thing. I feel it right here working against me. Like a, like a pain in my heart and a load upon my chest. Huh? You want to live like that? Yes, I want to live like that. I want to live like that. Where I have a, a Holy Ghost grief huh? and repulsive response towards all that's propagated in this world. And, and all you need to do is be filled. You want to walk in the mind of Christ? You'll have to shut down your reasonings. Do you know how difficult that is for older people? who've lived all their life by reasoning hmm, think, 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 think you know, if they were Einstein I could understand, maybe how is this should be a lot to give up, you know because that really worked out well the thinking power that was going on there but for most people, all it's done is put them into a, just a, whipped them into a frenzy of, of complete grief and poverty you know what I'm saying and the, so even if, no matter if you were the most brilliant thinker and reasoner to figure it all out and to finally settle out that okay I agree or oh, this is fine with me or whatever it is you know in your conclusions and you were the best thinker in the world should you be uh, given the opportunity to now have the mind of Christ wouldn't you just push all that stuff aside and say I don't go there anymore when somebody asks you to figure something out it's okay, no problem. Let me get back with you. Huh? Amen? You know, a wise person in the world, a wise person in the world told me you should have a 24-hour rule. That's just the way the world, bright, very bright, successful businessman said you should have a 24-hour rule. Don't make a decision until you had 24 hours. But think about it. Man, what if God's people just, instead of trying to figure things out and reason it through, a lot of people say, I'll pray about it. All they're saying is they're going to think about it. <laughs> huh? Because if they prayed about it, it would be an entirely different situation. But what if you trained yourself to do that? What if you were willing to train yourself to do that? And I'm gonna, we're going to have the School of the Spirit this Friday night. And that's what I do in the School of Spirit, is it's really about practical application. You, these are the things that are going on. If you, if you want to have what God has for you, you're going to have to stop this stuff. You're going to have to say, wait a minute, I don't try to think it through anymore. I praise it through. I pray it through. I just set it on side. I say, I bring it to the Lord. I, 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 one of the things I hope stood out to you when you were reading Joshua, the book of Joshua, is that here there was such great power and authority in Joshua's life command the sun and the moon to stand still you know the Jordan stacked up to the heavens so that they could walk across on dry land all these things and then the Gibeonites come along the Gibeonites come along with a little bit of moldy bread uh, just a little deceptive game that they played and deceived the whole lot of God's people why the scripture says because they sought not the Lord they tried to figure it out they reasoned it through they looked at all of the evidence the only reason they got fooled is because they, Scripture says, because they sought not the Lord. If you could learn to just take all of that stuff and say, Lord, I don't know about all this. I just put it on you. I cast my cares upon you. I'm going to let you figure it out. I'm going to come back over here and just enjoy worshiping you, praising you, knowing that everything's, you know, in your hands. I'm going to take care of the business at hand, the things that I got to do. I'm not going to be distracted. Come on, people. I'm talking about your biggest challenges in life now. Uh-huh. I know you want me to lay my hands on you and prophesy over you what you're going to do over the next three years. But I'm telling you right now, this is far more important to you. Because we could prophesy over you what you're going to do over the next three years and none of it happened. 
Huh? Somebody said, oh, uh, I was in a meeting and, and the prophet prophesied over me 15 years ago. Well, how long did he say it was going to take before you going to do what he said? <laughs> I reckon it ain't going to happen now. Okay? But besides that, look at how many things God's prophesied over you. You got a whole Bible full of God prophesying over you. I mean, we need to grab a hold of that. There are basic principles and spiritual laws of life. Rules that we need to learn and understand. And if we'll do them. Just says obedient children. Huh? Just the token, the testimony that we've been converted and become as little children. Mm -mm -mm. You got a problem? Here's what we tell you what do your problem here tonight. Turn it all over to Jesus. And now you don't have a problem anymore. Amen. In other words, cast all your worries, cast all your problems, cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Boy, isn't that hard to do, because you're going to lay down for a while when we're worshiping. Oh, yeah, I feel better. Oh, praise God. Hallelujah. And then as soon as you get ready to leave, you're going to grab your problems and take them with you. <laughs> Where's my problems at? Where did I, where did I set them down at? <laughs> you got to go grab the suitcase of problems, walk out with them, and then unfortunately bring them back to the next meeting. <laughs> I pray tonight you lose that stuff. I pray I can find it before you do and I burn it or something. Or, please, Lord, work a miracle here. Work a miracle. He knows the frailty of our lives. He knows how, he knows how long it takes for us to get it. Come on. He looks at a landscape of what he's got to work with. Huh? And if all of us could look at that with him, we would all go, oh, Lord, we are exceedingly sorry. And then hopefully we would move from that to saying, look, I, I want to be different. I, I want to be a cooperative person. Somebody said he didn't, call, he didn't call many noble, you know. And, um, and, and, and he didn't call many wise. I'm going to tell you right now, and fewer came. Because <laughs> that's the situation. The reality of it is, Father hasn't had many champions. And you're not going to change. We could, be, we could participate in changing that. We, it could be said when generations in the future come, they don't look back and say, they can count on one hand. <laughs> well, there was... Well, in that generation, there was George Whitfield, there was John Wesley, uh, there was Jonathan Edwards. They wouldn't look back and count on one hand. Well, there was this one, that one. But they would say, there was a mighty host. Huh? This is what Father's looking for. There's a mighty host, a great army that stood up. That's what happened in, that's what happened in the revival in Indonesia. Back in the 60s. A revival that was described as like a mighty wind. It was a whole army of just out of nowhere, a whole army of Indonesians stood up with the mighty power of God, walked across the water when the flood came and prevented them from going to the next village where the meeting was going to be taking place. They walked across the water. All the, all the miracles of the New Testament took place. A very short revival. Why? Because people just got so desperate for God. You know how you get desperate for God? You don't want anything else. Nothing else matters. Hard in this society. Hard. We got our house, our dog, our car, huh? our vacation, huh? our stocks, our stocks. Bring the serene up. Huh? Are you with me? I'm air trade. How are we doing on, how are we doing on that stock today? On, on and on and on and on. Things that steal our heart, steal our affection. Papa wants to come, wants us to come aside into a solitary place with him, and he wants to show us what's really going on. He wants to teach us about things that are not going to perish with the using. He wants to establish within our lives true riches. If you're investing in this earth, I'm telling you, it's a poor investment. It's getting all burned up. It's, uh, it's, it, I'm telling you, it's belly up for sure. Okay? Invest in heaven. Invest in the kingdom. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you.
So I said, why do you breathe on people? Because I'm inspired to do it. Do you have any authority to do it? Yes, Jesus, breathe on them. He said, receive the Holy Ghost. We pray that you be able to be sensitive to that too. Because if something's real is happening when that happens. When that good takes place. It's true. And we've seen we've seen the manifest miracles of God take place with just such simple little response, simple little participations of the Holy Ghost. Is that ever a simple participation with the Holy Ghost? To to just breathe, huh? Go. And to if it really isn't keeping with what the Holy Ghost is inspiring, wouldn't that be a simple participation with the Holy Ghost to see something miraculous take place? What do you imagine would be participation with the Holy Ghost to see some miracle take place? Because this is where it all breaks down. Are you with me? Or it builds up either way. But what we've seen is, you know, we've seen the mighty powers of miracles of God from the healing of those who are deaf, the mute, so many different miracles of God, even the blind seeing, just a little crippled walking. One day, one day, the Lord would do it in such a way, I know, and we're just going to be faithful with going with Him and not going with men, and doing what He's telling us to do, not what the reasoning thinks is the best thing to do. And we'll see whole masses of people mowed down with the power of God, slain by the presence of the Lord. I mean, literally, as it were, an act of baptism into His presence. Huh? Did you, everybody notice that when you, when I when I baptize you, I slam you into the water? Yeah. Bam! And then some of you, I hold you down a little while, and then we pull, we jerk you back up, amen. Because we just wanted to kind of give you a token of what it's like in heaven, what's going on in the realms of the spirit. We want the spirit of the Lord to slam you down on the ground tonight, amen, and hold you under, hold you under, ha ha ha. Hallelujah. And then tell you, you get to stay here if you would, if you would like. Somebody tell me, ah, I've heard many people say this. Oh, man, I went under the power of God. I was under the power for two, three hours. And then I want to think, I want to say, what happened after that? What happened to you after that? Where did you, where did you take a wrong turn, man? I mean, why didn't you stay there? Why didn't you go back there the first thing in the morning when you woke up? Because once you have access, you know how to get in from there on out. Right? Huh? I got some places I could take you out in the forest. Beautiful places. And it wouldn't take many times, once, twice, you know, depending on how good you are out there in the forest to get right back, go back to that place on your own. You was taken there. Huh? Huh? Hallelujah. You say, hey, where was it that spot you took, took me to? It's amazing. I said, oh, well, just go down here and then turn there and going up the road a little further and you'll see it and so then the preacher starts preaching and he just says basically the same thing and boom you're right back there right he says basically the same kind of directions on the Holy Ghost how to hook up how to be filled how to be filled how to be filled what's tough is when you've told people and taken them there and they stood there and looked and a <laughs> hundred times and then they still don't get it and you're trying to say just come here just do this be filled with the spirit <laughs> speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing and making melody in your heart giving thanks unto God ah recipe. and they said no that ain't gonna I need, to, I need a prayer line I need a devil cast out of me I'm telling you right now you don't understand what I went through today no, all you need is to be filled with the Spirit and begin to speak to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Oh, no, 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 you don't understand. You don't realize what I, you know, I'm in a negative. I'm in the red right now. And money is so huge to you that God is eclipsed by it. And the Lord says, no, don't do that. I'll be your remedy. I'll be your provider. I'll be your solution. All you got to do is be filled with the Spirit and quit making these things important to you that really are nothing more than idols. They're nothing more than modern day idols that are making you, forcing you to bow down and give a reverence to them. He said, no, no, we're not doing that no more. We're going to live in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. 
Now I'm going to tell you something. I want, I want, tonight I'm going to minister on reverence. I'm going to minister on reverence and the fear of the Lord. I want you to understand, there's nothing that changes the atmosphere and can grieve the Holy Ghost like people worshiping out of falsehood. Nothing, nothing, nothing is worse than coming into the sanctuary with a pig, an unclean animal. See, Isaiah described it. You approach it to me and it's, you bring a pig for a sacrifice and you cut off the head of a dog. Ah, everybody goes, ooh, that's terrible, those guys. Man, what was wrong with them? Reality of it is, is when we come with an insincere heart and we begin to participate in worship, it ain't right. It grieves the atmosphere. And then the preacher starts hollering. Who sent it to the Holy Ghost? See, you know what? My only thing that I have, people say, people say well, you got a gift you this, that. The only thing I got is the Holy Ghost. <laughs> That's all I have. I have the Holy Spirit. Catherine Kuhlman, other people that I could name, relegated very strongly what they would allow for worship because it would mess with the atmosphere. Relegated it. So just keep it simple. Simple song everybody knows. One or two of them. Okay? That's not what God's called me to do. God's called me to take people into a deeper realm of worship. Okay? And we have to understand this. You'll see. You watch me. You watch me. You'll see a different me sometimes before worship than after, after worship. On several different levels, for bad or for good. That's why it's very important to people who really want to understand these things. It's good to come in here and begin to pray and cry out to God for the sacred, for the reverence, for his fire, for truth. Because you lay a foundation in the atmosphere. Yes. People walk in and they can't hold on, harbor secret sin. They can't be insincere. They can't just stand there. People got all kinds of iniquity going on in their life and they're going, bye, 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 bye. Ooh. 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 Bad, 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 bad. Bad. That can that can get that can get really really bad. That can be so insulted to the Holy Ghost it can even get worse than that. And I I'm not going to go there. You listen to me now. You hear me. You hear me. This is sacred. It's so sacred you can't even imagine how sacred it is. And that's why I'm going to talk about it tonight. And it's going to help you understand some of the things you've been reading in the Bible. Why you don't understand? Why the extremes? Why such? Whoa! What a reaction. Huh? Because God will be sanctified in everyone who draws unto, near unto him. And he hadn't changed. His father, father has come in this new period of time we call the new covenant. And he's made known and revealed in an unprecedented way his love and his mercy and his grace. But he's not changed about the way he feels about the sacred. Or the way he feels about the holy the way he feels about sin and iniquity. Father's not changed. People want to say he's changed. He's not changed. He just made a way so that you and I could be cleansed and that you and I could be taught the sacred. He gave us the sacred spirit, the Holy Spirit, which is the same word. I want you to get that. The sanctifying spirit, the consecrating spirit. What has he sanctified and consecrated us and made us holy with respect to having nothing to do with that which is common and unclean and of the world? Father has nothing to do with the world. He has no fellowship with it. You better make sure that you, know, you, can, you can fool your papa and your mama. You can fool your husband or your wife. You can play games with people around you and pretend. But don't do that with Father. It's the highest of violation. It's the highest of spiritual violations that exist. You better realize that I'm telling you the truth. I, I just, I'm telling this for, to you for two reasons. One, first and foremost, for you personally, for your own sake and your soul. Second, I'm telling you so that you can understand how to participate with the church, the body of Christ, which is God's cure and remedy for every social and moral evil that exists on the earth today. God's cure for darkness and blindness of heart and mind. God's cure for every soul that is on its way to a devil's hell for eternity is his church, his light that shines in the midst of a dark and perverse world. We're going to have to get serious. We're going to have to understand our responsibility. I pray that you'll hear the word of the Lord that we delivered unto you Sunday morning about participating with God and hastening the day of the Lord. 
looking unto and hastening the day of the Lord. Recognize that nothing about doesn't infringe upon Father's sovereignty at all. It really comes and brings to bear each of our individual responsibilities to participate with them. So, Father, I thank you for the anointing. I thank you for the fresh wind of heaven. I thank you for the glory of the Holy Ghost. I thank you, Father, for truth in the inward parts and in the hidden parts. You making men to know what's real, what's true. Hallelujah. I thank you, Father, for your forgiveness over and again. Your mercy that has no end. How that for 490 times a day you would forgive us if we would also forgive others out of the same heart. Father, that there is no running out of mercy for, with you, for your mercy endures forever. That there's no reason that anyone should fail, for there's always an opportunity to get clean and start again and start afresh and start anew. And so that everybody in this place, Father, and everybody that comes and is born in this place will recognize with you, Father, there is a love that never fails. There is a mercy that is without end. But there is a truth that you demand. Realness. The same kind of a truth. I'm going to tell you too, this just before we worship a bit. And, and, I, and I, just, I want you, I want you to, to just get an offering ready. Just, I want you to worship the Lord with an offering tonight. Be, you know, it's just, we're getting ready to start worship here in just a minute. But I want you to just grab a hold of this. You don't want no fake relationships in your life either. Huh? You don't want nobody coming over you and smiling in your face and telling you how wonderful you are and then going right out and then telling people how terrible you are. Huh? You don't want fake, false re relationships. Nobody does. No one does. How much more Father doesn't want that? Does that make sense to you? Just, Father just wants us to be real. <laughs> he wants us to be real. That's all. Just be real with Him. Be real with yourself. And only the Holy Ghost can give you the ability to be real with yourself. And if you've done wrong, don't hide it. Repent. Just repent. That's my, that's my job description, to command people to repent. Just repent. A preacher came up to me one day, time I was in South Africa, and he said, oh, so-and-so's upset with me because he didn't feel I did it right. And I, he said, what, he said, like asking me, he was, I don't know what he was asking me, but I told him as though he was asking me. I said, well, just repent. He looked at me like, because the reality of it is he was talking about the guy that was in charge. He was a preacher, had a great ministry, but he was doing some work for the guy that was in charge, a minister that was in charge that he had made himself servant to. And now he's complaining that the man, he made, the man of God that he made himself servant to wasn't happy with his work. So what's the cure? To say, oh, yeah, I know he's an unreasonable guy. Man, he's just pushy. Huh? No, that's not an answer. The answer is, you've done wrong, buddy. According to the man of God, you've done wrong, so repent. Eh? Wow! Wouldn't that change the dynamics of our life if we got that real? Because he wanted me to feel sorry for him. Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> Believe me, I've been traveling with him for a couple of years. I know. you got to get it done right or it's wrong. Terrible, ain't it? I mean, can I say that again? you got to get it done right or it's wrong. It's a terrible thing, isn't it? Should I say it again? Somebody that actually expects, expects that you've got to do it right or it's wrong. What a terrible thing, eh? Jesus, help us. And Father's is made so easy. Get everything restored. Beautiful thing is the preacher went and repent, repented. He said, he said, man of God, please forgive me. I'm sorry. I, I messed the whole thing up. And it was easy. Now it's all, everything's good. Everybody's walking around with arms around each other, hugging on each other. Everybody's good. Everybody's good. I pray that you have the gospel of peace. I pray that you understand that that's what your responsibility is, people that are around you. The Lord says if you do well and take it patiently and suffer for it and take it patiently, hey, that's thankworthy. He said, but if you've done wrong and you get corrected, you know what? You needed it. Amen? Amen. Good. Now, if you're just willing to do that, there's no reason. There's no reason you can't just go straight right up into divine realms of heaven tonight. Amen. Amen. You just get your heart right with God. Get your heart right with people around you. Just do it Papa's way because you're not going to get what he has if you want it your way. 
He, you can't have what he's got for you if it's got to be your way. Huh? Arabasara mangaya. You can always tell the people who are enjoying doing it Father's way. They got a smile. They look good. They're happy. Everybody else looks like there's something hurting them. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> People said, oh, he just expects us to be happy all the time. <laughs> Who are you referring to? Oh, the preacher. Oh, no, 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 no. You meant God. You meant God. You meant God. Oh, God, God he just expects us to be happy all the time. <laughs> yeah, he does. And he's going to supply the ability to be that. And all the stuff that is working on you to make you unhappy, those are the things that are keeping you from that encounter that he wants you to have. So that you may know him in a way. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. So come worship the Lord with your offering. Come on, let's worship. got to be bit, bit you got to be a bit more ready than that come on we worship <laughs> Lord be magnified in all this earth. be glorified in all my life yeah Woo-hoo! Reveal your glory and let it be known that all creation is your own.
<laughs> this is our, our heart's desire, Lord. Oh, I pour out revival's rain. So this world will never be the same. To it, Father, by your oh, power. In my life, Lord, be magnified, be magnified, oh, in my life, Lord, same chords, oh, be magnified right now. Oh, in my life, Lord, be glorified, be glorified, oh, in my Oh, in your church, Lord, be glorified, be glorified, be glorified in your church, Lord, be glorified tonight. Be glorified in me, be highly exalted, reveal your Son in me, be glorified, oh God. 
be highly exalted. Reveal your son. Reveal your son in me. Got a manjera, get a mama and hero. Get a mama and a jero, mama and a man and a gay umbrella, and a local man and a gay erebe. Holy, holy is the Lord. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Heaven and earth and my life, it is filled with the glory. Holy, holy is the Lord. Ha ha. Woo. Ha ha ha. Holy, 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 holy. Holy, holy is the Lord. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Heaven and earth and my life. Heaven and earth and my life is filled. Holy, holy. Holy, holy. Holy, holy is the Lord. Holy, holy. Kina mangi ebera na majesi tu yerahaya. Mama mana na nene. Kira mama mama nene. Dere na mana na seire de yo. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, mighty God. Thank you, mighty God. Thank you, mighty God. Thank you, mighty God. Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, mighty God. Oh, thank you, mighty God. Hallelujah. Thank you, mighty God. We worship you. Thank you, mighty God. Thank you, mighty God. Hallelujah. Thank you, mighty God. We worship you. Lord, we worship you. Lord, we worship you. Nianka da tabasiti ya tekin. Kinana na kape este pere ne patiela. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Well, why don't you just have a seat for just a little bit longer? Let me let me just share some things with you here in, in the in the Word of God, so that you can understand how you're supposed to behave yourself. And um, Hallelujah. In not only in the house of God, but also as you walk out your life before the presence of the Lord. Now understand. Father's given you an opportunity that nobody else had in times past where that you get to live out your life before the presence of the Lord. 
I mean, you get to walk before God in a way that you could only have said in the Old Testament that Moses walked before God that way. Where God is actually dwelling in your midst. Where he's, where he's, where he's intimately involved with you. He's not, he doesn't know you from afar off. God has no, no knowledge of the wicked in, this, in that sense of knowing, of intimacy, of relationship. He knows them as it were afar off. He sees what's going on in the world. You know, for example... In the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, the Lord sent down messengers to see, check it out, is it as bad as the report that I've been getting? So he knows the wicked are far off. He doesn't have an intimate relationship with them. Here, Father has invited you and I to come live in the holies of holies. And in fact, he made a way to where the holies of holies come live in us. That's, my goodness, that's pretty powerful, isn't it? Now, you're going to have to know how to properly conduct yourself under such a, a a privilege and opportunity that has been granted to us and the more that we will reverence God then the more we will profit from the re relationship in fact the more we will simply reverence God the less likely we are to violate any of the spiritual laws of life and believe me that believe me that there is a consequence to to violating spiritual laws as much as there is a consequence to violating natural and physical laws and so I, I'm, I'm going to bring you into a shocking story, okay? I'm going to bring you a shocking story that a lot of people don't understand so that ultimately I, I can lay a foundation for you to get the, the kind of, of reverence that the Holy Spirit has come to teach us. And um, sometimes we look in the, in the Bible and we see just some major shock events. So open your Bible to 2 Kings chapter 1. This is a shocking event. And the shocking event is... Uh, the, the, the son of Ahab and Jezebel. What a son. What a, what, what a family heritage to be the son of Ahab and of Jezebel. And um, he was in... Uh, <laughs> Ahaziah was walking in the rebellion of his father and of his mother. And so, could everybody hear me? Going to wait for everybody to find their seat. Los to Paul you can anaya, hapaturi, liberasi. And um, this guy is so messed up. He's he he injured himself. You know he fell down. He injured himself. And so what he did was he sent messengers to Beelzebub, the god of Ekron. Said find out whether or not I'm going to get cured from the sickness. What he was doing was he's saying there is no god in Israel. That's what he's saying, defiantly. He's saying Baal is God, and he takes the worst of the, of the deities that they worship, Beelzebub, which in the New Testament is an, an alternate name for Satan himself. And he says, go find out, go inquire of Beelzebub whether, I get a good, whether I'm going to get um, better or not. And, of course, you know what happens. Prophet meets him in the way and says, you know, just go tell him he's not getting better, you know. And so now he's all upset. He says, go get that guy. And so they come up in First King, or Second Kings, chapter one, verse ten, and and, and the and um, God had arranged the troops in Israel by one thousand, by a thousand, or over a thousand, over a hundred, or by fifties, and that's the way the troops were arranged. And so he sent out a, a, that uh, um, garrison, if you would, of fifty, and they insult him, and he said, "Really, they're saying you're no man of God. Pretend man of God if you're a man of God, kind of thing." It was an insultive remark. Oh, man of God, come down here king wants you and he's a greater authority than you and so what he does now is he's going to say if i am a man of god then fire comes down out of heaven and consumes you because they have no reverence they have no respect this isn't the first time this has happened we saw it happen when aaron had a bunch of people around him that thought that they knew what was going hey can you turn me up a little bit they thought they knew what was going on with god better than anybody else Okay, they thought, well, listen, Aaron and Moses, you don't really have it all figured out. You know, we've got to weigh in on this thing, too. So the, the fire came out and consumed them. And, of course, we also have another example of where the fire of God is, is it, not, not too loud, not too loud. It, it gets, the pendulum gets swinged a lot around here. But at any rate, not, here, we got, here we got the situation where um, Nadab and Abihu are going to come up and worship God, and now they're going to do it in a different way. They're going to add a little, a few things. They're going to, they're going to change up things just a little bit. And, um, you know, what I'm talking about is very, very crucial to me. It's very important to me. And the atmosphere has got to be right. And, and what I'm dealing with is I'm dealing with problematic issues. 
that are going on, okay? And so, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I take control every, over every spirit in this place in Jesus' name so that you can hear the word of the Lord, so that you can understand what's required of you. And I want tonight, I want you to know that there, it, it, I am preaching by the Spirit of the Lord to every single person in the house, including myself. So I want you to get it settled in your spirit right now. You're being preached to, okay? He's talking just about me. I, want you to, I don't want that to be an offensive thing. I want you to grab a hold of this now. Okay, and I want you to understand that you're not really going to move on with God very much. Turn this down. You're not going to move on with God very much if you continue to live the way that you live. You're going to basically have what you have, and nothing's going to change. You're going to have to make adjustments in your life, and those adjustments are things that Father puts his finger on and points out to you if you're going to see a greater manifestation of his majesty and of his glory because father's realm is very sacred to him and he's not going to compromise it just so that we can have a revival <laughs> he's not going to compromise it just so that we can have the things that we're asking for on our terms he wants us to ask for his outpouring of his glory he wants us to ask for the baptism of the holy spirit which he gives to us and, he, and it's a beautiful thing in the mercy and the grace of God. He's poured out his holy, sacred fire and glory upon a bunch of undeserving people. He's just giving, giving these things to us. But what's supposed to happen is we're supposed to respond to such an amazing gift that is given to us. People act like they've arrived. They've act like, you know, well, you know, I'm, you know, I'm good to go and I'll just stay right here. And I don't have to uh, allow God to make adjustments and changes in my life, which is just... It was just ridiculous to even consider that that would be a possible state of someone's thinking, but it obviously is. God in his mercy and his grace poured out the things that are so sacred to him so that you and I could be conducted by the Holy Spirit into the presence of the Lord and be trained up, not by a Samuel the prophet, not by an Elijah the prophet. And boy, Elisha had it going good for him. He got to be trained by Elijah. What an amazing prophet. I mean, you could say, I would have loved to be in that position with him no 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 you got a better position because the holy ghost himself has come to train you and me we've just got to grab a hold of the reality of that because it's a little bit too fictional to us still it's a little bit too unseen and esoteric and oh really is it really really true and how much is it that i'm going to actually pay attention to the holy spirit recognize and cooperate with him because if we do I'm telling you, Father has not withheld any of the dimensions of his divine power, of his glory, of a heavenly expression from any of us. There's nobody that's like, oh, well, you know, you're only allowed to have just so many gifts of the Spirit. And No, no, no. Father has given to us an unlimited measure, the fullness of everything that he possesses. He made us right now the heirs of God and co-inheritors with Jesus in the partnership that he's given to us specifically to represent him not to sit back and feel wonderful you know expressions of divine glory in our living room and not do anything with it uh, rather to have wonderful divine expressions of glory in our living room to rise up from that place and go out into a world around us and represent him and fundamentally to begin to participate with what he wants to do in the midst of his church which is very precious to him his church is so precious it is so sacred that in the early church, the first century church, the scripture said in Acts chapter 5, they feared to join themselves unto them. And that word fear is going to be a very important word for you to grab a hold of tonight. They feared to join themselves unto them. Mm. Why? Because Ananias and Sapphira, Sapphira fell down dead for a lion. Because God's house is very sacred. Actually, the church is actually the holies of holies. Because, and Paul put it on that level in his, in his declaration of the Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 12 and beginning in verse 22 and 23. He takes and says, he brings all the glory and all the manifestation, the fullness of the power of God that was revealed at Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb. And he brings it in the context of the church and says, you're not in an in, in earthly realm anymore. You in heavenly realm, you become, you come before innumerable company of saints innumerable angels a great company of saints just men made perfect for the god god the judge of all the world jesus the mediator you know and so here we are right now in a sacred realm that we never really understood we haven't fully understood it 
we, we don't understand fully the protocol of God. God had a protocol. He still has a protocol. God had a protocol, and he still has a protocol. In the, in, when, when Aaron went into the temple, when Aaron went into the holies of holies, he went there by the direct instruction of a living God to do it exactly like God said to do it. He didn't just make it up as he goes. He didn't just decide one day, okay, well, we've come to a deeper revelation. We've been walking with God now for quite some time, and we've matured, and now we know something more about what we're actually supposed to do. No, Father knows exactly what he wants us to do for all time, and that's exactly the way it's supposed to be done. And now Nadab and Abihu try to bring a little theme to that. They offer strange fire, and the fire of God or the lightnings of God. People talk about the lightnings of God, and, you know, they talk about it on a good thing, on a good, a good note. Oh, the lightnings of God are going to strike you and boy, Lord let your lightning strike us and all that's wonderful and everything but when the lightnings of God struck Nadab and Abihu they fell down dead it was a result of the uh, the Lord making it emphasizing that if you come into his presence he will be sanctified he will be set apart he will be made he will be consecrated he will be made holy, as it were, by all of those who approach unto him. And, of course, that's Leviticus chapter 10. And I referred also to Numbers chapter 14. And, and then, of course, the rights and the privileges of how they were supposed to approach unto God. Exodus 28, Leviticus chapter 8 and chapter 9. Just so that you can have, you know, no sh you, know you can go back and do your homework and understand what I've been describing to you. And so, um, these company of men, they didn't really learn to reverence anything about the things of God um, well they did because it was over for them but the rest of Israel they didn't learn um, anything about reverencing the, uh, the things of God they immediately in the arrogance and the pride of their own heart sent up 50 more and this time they behaved themselves even more arrogant, arrogantly and they said man of God come down to us immediately so now they're even being more arrogant about it. They're demanding in the name of the king, he wants to see your, you right now. And they said, well, if I'm a man of God, fire comes down out of heaven, consumes you right now. Somebody said, my goodness. You know, I heard one theologian said, see, it just shows the humanity of Elijah. He was having a bad day. <laughs> and, well, okay, I'll tell you right now, that doesn't show the humanity of Elijah because I'm telling you right now, no fire would have come down out of heaven unless Father would have been in partnership with him. And I'm telling you right now, Moses wasn't having a bad day when the earth opened up and swallowed Korah, Korah, right? Dathan. And, uh, you know, the, the whole company. Come on now. Father, this, these things are sacred to the Lord. Yeah. What we don't understand, we don't, we don't get the insult of sin and iniquity and rebellion and defiance that is doing everything that can possibly be done to shut God completely out of creation. We don't understand a war that is uh, right now waging. There's, there are very few people. I, it seems to me in modern times there's very few watchmen that are standing up on the, on the, on the, uh, the, the watchtower or the, or the battlements is another way to, to refer to it. The place where the watchers watch for the enemy that is coming and the, and the strategy that the enemy is about to execute to try to take the city and crying out to the people to arise into the battle. It just seems that there's somehow a, 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 a concept now that sin can go and, and you can do whatever you want to do in the realms of sin and defiance and disobedience. You can behave yourself in whatever way you want to and God is going to accept it. He's going to accept whatever we, whatever things we give him, he's going to, you know, he just got to take it and it's going to be acceptable to him. And it's just not the case. It simply isn't the case. In fact, if it is dear people, if you don't grab a hold of reverence for God and the fear of the Lord, you will never have the wisdom that it takes to say no to sin because you will always justify it. You'll always find a reason and an excuse for why it's okay. So the third time, at least somebody's got a little bit of reverence now. And the guy, you know, the, the, the head of the 50 comes, bows down before him and says, please, don't destroy us. Please, just hearken, just hear our voice with great respect. They entreat him now. Will he please come up and see the king? And so Elijah is willing to go. 
really they're not interacting with the man. They're, acting, they're interacting with God's representative. They think they're interacting with the man. And of course, they addressed him as God's re representative, the man of God. The man of God means God's representative. But they addressed him in an insultive way. They didn't believe a single thing that was coming out of their mouth. So the reality of it is what was coming out of their mouth is you are the representative of God. In reality, we're interacting with God and we're telling you that the son of Ahab and Jezebel is in charge. And he demands you to come over so he can straighten you out. In fact, under that particular, in that particular uh, approach in which Ahaziah, Ahaziah sent um, his... his uh, group of 50, they were coming to grab Elijah to bring him back to kill him. That was what their purpose was. Now I want you to open your Bibles with me here quickly to um, Psalms chapter 89. Father, just thank you right now for a breakthrough. Listen, you must understand, I'm, gonna, I'm ministering to you something that is very difficult for anybody to get because Satan doesn't want you to get it. It is really the strategy of the enemy right now to stop and shut down the moving of the Spirit of God. It functions, it operates within the realm of the pride of life because there's never way, any way that you're going to have reverence until you get down on your knees like the third captain did. Until you begin to humbly approach the presence of God with fear and trembling. There's just no way. Pride of life's not going to do that. Deception is not going to allow you to do it. And, and, the, and real, without reverence, without, the, without reverence, you have no tone of the sacred. Sacred is going to create reverence. Reverence is going to be a participate with the sacred. And, and, you know, it was something that when I look back on time, we look back and we look at, at, at other revivals in the past, at least people had an opportunity to somehow get this because most people still called preachers reverend. And that is really far from anything you do anymore. I mean, it's pretty big. You're cutting edge respect if you call your pastor pastor, you know. Just to, and what is that about? It's really about acknowledging the office of God. There's still a lot of people that just call me Mark. And they don't understand what they're doing. And what became a point in my time, time in my life where the Lord said, no, you need to correct them. They're not because they just treat you. They treat you profanely. They don't recognize the office. And so I've said to some people, you know, you know they're, they're trying to get me to tell them what they should and should not do. I say, you know what? You need to know God enough to be able to do the right thing without me having to tell you what to do. You shouldn't have to live under a law. You should know by the Spirit what's right and wrong. And, I mean, I'll tell you, if you really want to impress me, if I want, you know, there's certain things that you need to do to... to um, to recognize the sacred. Somebody says, there where it says in the Bible, you're supposed to call your pastor, pastor. No, no, not specifically. Um, you know, but there is a whole lot about reverence and respect and recognizing the gift and honoring what God is doing. And how is it that you're going to set up principles in your life so that you can have reverence and respect and honor? Because we live in a society where people don't honor their father and their mother. They don't know how to reverence their, that, that those basic authorities that, that are placed in their life and just in, in, a, in, a, in, in any dimension, in a family way, a secular way. And now that's just going to spill over into how they interact with God. And when there's not going to be any reverence and when there's not going to be any honoring of the sacred, when there's, there's not going to be any respect, there's not going to be really the, the kind of obedience and the observance that needs to be in our interaction with God. And so we're just going to, be, we're going to just do it our own way. And, and, and it's not going to be a warm and fuzzy thing. And it's not going to be bubbly. And it's not going to have the Holy Ghost much in it at all. Other than his, in his mercy and his love, he's going to be working with us, continually saying, look, you're going to have to learn reverence. You want to come into my, you want to come into my presence? You say you want to come into my presence. You say you want the fullness of my spirit. You say you want to interact with me in the realms of the holies of holies. Then you've got to understand reverence. <laughs> you've got to understand honor. You've got to understand the sacred. And we don't get that. He's talking to us like that all the time, and we don't get it. But he's so merciful, he just keeps talking to us until we get it. 
And then all of a sudden we recognize, wait a minute, I'm not getting it and people aren't getting it around me primarily because it is actually the way that Satan is organizing his defense and his strategy against any advancement of the kingdom of God. So then somebody stirs himself up and says, I'm going to get valiant here now. I'm not going to sit around and let this stuff go down. I'm going to understand how to be a part of this reverence and this honor and this respect and, 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 and observing the holiness of God, which is the holiness of holinesses, and understanding that it's a real practical interaction with him on the basis of the way that you live your life and the way you interact with that which he calls sacred and holy. <laughs> and my goodness... Um, Father's made that very personal with the Holy Ghost having come to live on the inside of us. Whew. And then all of a sudden you recognize, wait a minute, my hands are holy and my feet and, and my body is the purchased possession of the living God. It's his temple. And he says, you dishonor it. You, he says, you defile it and I'll destroy your soul in hell. Because... because because it's very sacred things to God. And we think, we think that some hideous murder is terrible, terrible, and the person ought to be, is worthy of death to do it. And they are, sure. From all the natural laws, absolutely. But we don't recognize that these violations against the sacred are just as hideous to God. People don't recognize this. They, don't say, they say, how can a loving God create an eternal torture chamber called hell? That don't make any sense. Well, the problem is you don't understand how bad sin really is. See, the whole concept of sin to God is as horrific as the concept of an eternal torture chamber is to us. We don't even relate to that. We can't even relate to that because sin is so common and the people that we love are in, engulfed in it and it doesn't seem to be so bad till we see its consequences uh, over time. Well, what we do know is that all sin leads to death now and in the future. And Father doesn't want the disease. In fact, it is everything opposite of him. And, and, and to use the word opposite is a very weak word because it's worse than that. <laughs> it's, it's worse than any word that can even be described. And the only way you can describe how bad sin is is to talk about an eternal torture chamber, a hell, a death that is eternal. That's how bad it is. And so Father is wanting to teach us. He's wanting to bring us out of a place. I, I don't know. I think that this modern age is probably as bad if maybe even worse than the people that Paul was ministering to that were coming out of worshiping the, the goddess Diana or Zeus or Apollo who had all kinds of wicked practices and immorality immersed in their idolatry. It's probably much more difficult to try to bring the Gentiles into the kingdom of God and help them understand the sacred and help them understand coming out of the world and not participating with the evil in it. People say, I don't want nothing to do with communing with demon spirits. I don't want anything to do with, uh, with interacting with Satan. Then really, you don't want anything to do with sin because really sin is the act of doing both. It's interacting with demon spirits and it's actually given place uh, to Satan as a person that you're going to submit your to and it's even worse than that it's even worse than that but we can't understand it we can't get it based upon the normal criteria of what we know and understand and what we see around us God the Holy Ghost comes to open up our eyes to cause us to be able to to really realize what, what's taking place father wants to interrupt our world and shock us and he's done it in a way that is far greater than sending fire down out of heaven and consume 50, and then 50 more. He's done it in a far greater way than uh, uh, Nadab and Abihu being cut down when they came into the sanctuary. He's done it in a far more intense way than the earth opening up and swallowing a great company of people. He's done it in a far more intense way than a fire going out from his midst and, and swallowing up all of those who thought themselves worthy to come and stand in Aaron's place, which God had sanctified him to stand there. Aaron didn't do it on his own. God sanctified him to stand there. And then all these other men want to stand alongside him and says, I'm just as good as Aaron. And if Aaron could stand there, so can I. And they found out, wait a minute. <laughs> you might think you're just as good as Aaron in a natural place. You might even be better. But God put an anointing on him and gave him a divine ability and a permission to come and stand in a place that he had no right to stand. That he was not worthy of standing there. And so now you're going to reason through your own intellect that you allowed to come there too. Well, fire comes out and just, just 
destroys them. Because and people say, that is just harsh. My goodness, that is just cruel. Uh, this must be another God. This can't be the same God in the New Testament. Because they have no understanding of a conflict between God and the things of the Spirit and the rebellious age in which we live. And how is it that you and I are going to be completely freed from that? Father showed us the most radical testimony when Jesus was crucified at Calvary and he died and suffered in such a hideous way showing to us the consequence and the wage of sin to be for us a door and an entrance now to be able to come and stand before the Father with none of its ill effect being able to be in even have a residue upon us none of its sin that would separate having any power to hold us back from him or to shut us out of his presence but he still makes it very clear how we're going to come and he makes it he makes it actually more strict than what it was for Aaron he makes it one way by one means he gives us access by the blood of Jesus Christ he gives us access by the Holy Spirit and somehow we get all of our mind and all of our thinking, what we think ought to be happening in the meeting and what our, what our belief system tells us and, and our concept. And then it goes, gets worse than that. It erodes worse than that. It's now about what our emotions are. You've got to listen to me. You've got to try to pay attention to me. You've got to really hang on to this because you don't understand. I am up against the strategic force by which Satan stops the advancement of the kingdom of God right now in this time period. You've got to understand, this is going to take a whole lot of, 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 this is going to take a whole lot of grabbing a hold of yourself and effort. It's going to take a whole lot of submitting yourself to the Holy Spirit to say, Lord, Lord I want to get this. I want to understand this. It's going to, it's going to, it, my goodness, you're going to have to strap yourself in, as it were. Because the enemy of your soul is, and the enemy of the, uh, of the host of uh, the Lord, the enemy of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, the enemy of the purposes of God is doing everything possible to make sure that this doesn't get across to you. Because I'm going to say it erodes even more. And now, all of a sudden, whatever your emotional state is begins to dictate to you how you're going to interact with God. And whatever your body says... And whatever your feelings say and whatever your opinions are at the time. Ooh, and is that ever fluctuating? Somebody said, are you serious? Are you telling me that we're going to have to learn how to approach unto God where we come to Him by the Spirit? Are you kidding me? Are you telling me that we're going to have to understand a way to be baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ in order to be connected with what Father wants to do as His church and as a part of His church in the midst of the earth today? Are you telling me that we're going to have to understand how to fear and tremble with the, with the wet, warm blood of Jesus Christ on us as we stand before the presence of the Lord? Yeah, exactly. And I, now, oh, religion won't do. And the only way you're going to get that is you're going to have to have an encounter with God that causes you to know Him so that the blindness of heart and mind no longer is able to influence you so that you just come and approach unto God whatever way you want to and interact with His holy things in whatever way you think is appropriate at the time. Because such subjection, sub, such subjectivity does not exist in God. It doesn't exist. Hmm. <laughs> It doesn't exist. The Holy Spirit is in control. He is, he is appointing to each man and each woman what it is they are going to do. He divides individually according to his will. <laughs> he decides who's going to do what. And then if we are in love with him and we want to honor him, we get all excited about his choices. And we are very reverential towards those things that he's that he's doing. We don't run roughshod over the, the expression of the language. We don't uh, take it and make it uh, as something that is common and ordinary. We don't, uh, we don't interrupt those things that God is doing. We, we, have, a different, we have a different sense and state and, 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 and attitude towards God that allows us to be in a place of submission to him where he can show us what's really going on. This is a difficult message. And it's a difficult message because people are going to have to be able to pray through to touch this. This is where all of a sudden Holy Ghost conviction returns to the church. This is a place where great reverence returns to the church. This is a place where the great sacredness returns to the church. And now the Holy Ghost is free to move in such a way. I mean, I praise the Lord 
for the manifest, his manifest presence that accompanies us in the church here in the abiding place. But I know that what I know it's just enough so that people can understand that he's present here. And it's just enough for people to begin to be called to come on in into a greater place of submission and surrender to his holy name and to his holy purposes. If you spend your life all day doing your own will and walking after your own purpose, it's a very difficult thing to come one night or two nights a week to a church meeting and suddenly switch. And now you're going to be all for God? It ain't going to work. If you're going to get this, you're going to have, there's going to have to come some sacred in your life on a daily basis to where that it, you're, you're understanding, no, I'm not doing it my way. I'm going to honor God. I'm going to honor the Holy Spirit. I'm going to recognize Him. I'm going to come under His rule and His leadership. Now, all of a sudden, you step into context here in the church. You're that much more sensitive than and possibly responsive to doing what it is that He wants to inspire you to do, to recognize the glory of His person and His purpose in the house. you listening to me. Otherwise, all you're going to do is come under the same influence that has ruled you the rest of the time. And you're going to be battling in your mind and in your thoughts all of your own opinions and all of your own wishes and all of your own preferences. And this ain't about whether or not you like green beans or corn. Huh? It isn't about some preference and some taste and some individual interest. This is about what God demands. And He's not compromising it. So, you open with me here to Psalms 89. And, and let me just say, those of you that are w working through the Word of God with us right now, uh, you know, maybe you've not been through, some of you here, you, maybe you've not been through the Bible, you've not read through the Bible like this in 90 days. And what you're dealing with right now is you're going through the times of, of First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles you know, on the hills of Judges, where you're having a look at the dynamic that is going on primarily between a rebellious people and a God who's not, and God who's not really saying much. He's just disciplining. And now you've got to wait to get into the prophets to hear Father's side. Now, because Father's going to start pleading. When you hit the prophets, you're going to start hearing what Father is saying and been, had been saying all the time that wasn't part of the narrative that you're in right now. And so some of the acts are pretty shocking. But I'm going to tell you right now, there is absolutely nothing that Father is doing and that He's, that he's done and that He's going to do in the future that is, can be compromised. This is a difficult thing for us to grab a hold of. This is difficult. Because we, we really believe that we should weigh in. It is really a gigantic difficulty to begin to move past the influences of the spirit of humanism that tries to justify everything. I heard one of our senators get up and say, the other day, oh, we just want a clean house and we want to show people that we are doing that which is right. I'm like, what on earth are you talking about? So they could go ahead and expose, you know, what went, went on in, after 9-11 with the CIA. I said, if, you in any, if there was any truth to that, you would get up and repent for the abortions that go on in this nation. You'd get up and repent for defying the natural laws of God and saying that homosexual marriage is something that, needs to, that, that, is, that is right and good and needs to be allowed. I mean, and I go through the list. So that, that kind of nonsense in a humanism, in the world of humanism, where men's reasoning uh, begin to calculate what's good and, and what's evil. What's right and what's wrong. What should exist and what shouldn't exist. It's all over the place. It's, it's, it's hampering you. It's on you. And more than likely, it's influencing you in your judgments. Or I could say it. I could dilute that judgment word a little bit, a little bit and say decisions. And what I'm here to do is try to help you say, no, 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 no. I don't want this stuff influencing my decisions. I don't want these things influencing my judgment. I don't want to live after my own human reasoning. I don't want to walk in, the, in, my, in, my, in my own understanding. 
I want to walk in the mind of Christ. I want to walk in the mind of the Spirit. I want to learn how to interact with God. I want to truly be all in on His side. I'm telling you right now. I am, going to, I am part of an army that is going to come with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm going to be right there with Him slaying all the wicked and rejoicing that it's getting done quickly. All humanity rises up and says, no, that's not fair. We want it our way. But what is their way? Their way is tyranny and oppression and destruction and, and slavery and, and every evil thing that could be imagined that men could do to men. And that the only reason that men aren't doing it to men in the full expression of what we've seen in the past is because of divine restraint. That's it. Divine restraint. And it would have been even worse then if there hadn't been a divine restraint. <laughs> and the divine restraint as we see it in the days of Noah was God said, I'm wiping this thing out. Because there ain't no restraining it. I had it never entered my mind that men could be so wicked. It never entered my mind that men could do such evil things to one another. I never, I never, I never imagined it, God said. It repents me. I repent right now before all my creation that I ever made a man. That's what God said. I repent before everything that I ever made one. That's pretty radical. Now then what happens is that you've got to go get yourself right in the context of that because we want to say them, those guys, boy, they are bad. <laughs> but you and I got to get right in the context because we, we up to it in our, up to it above our eyebrows. Not just to our neck. We up above our eyebrows in it. We all in the mess. We're deep in it. Are you listening to me? And God in his mercy came and rescued us out of it so to, and cleaned us up of the, of, of the filth and of the mire and of the muck of sin and death and set us in his place of holiness and set us in this place of rightness and set us in this place of his goodness and said, come here, stay here. I want to teach you how to live an entirely different life. You've been living an insane life. In other words, insanity is to be in Satan. You've been living a demonic life. You've been living the life of a dog. You've been living the life of an animal. You've been living the life of a creature that I repented I ever even made. God never repented over wells. He never repented over the butterflies, bumblebees, or nothing else. He repented over man. He saved everything else. Are you listening to me? Come on now. And you and I are deep in the mess. We're deep in the muck. Somehow we don't get it. We think our filth is clean filth. And we think we can bottle up our nastiness and sell it. Now we've got to watch out, people. Now listen to me. I'm being very, very harsh. You know, you say, I'm being very violent, very intense with it because it has to be dressed violently and it has to be addressed intense. Okay? Because really, we have, we're going to have to rise up to our battlements now. We're going to have to rise up to a place of, of war now. We're going to have, in this place, we're going to have to understand now you be strong and strength of the Lord and the power of His might, taking yourself the whole armor of God. Because so that you may stand against all the wiles of the devil. Because we're now wrestling against spiritual wickedness in high places. This is what it's all about. See, Satan's always doing just enough. Well, he, the way he, he tries to run under the radar in your life. He tries, to, he tries to, ultimately, if you're going to be a person who's redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, walk with God, and he can't, he can't persuade you to... To renounce that and go back to believing that you're a descendant from a monkey or even worse than that, it doesn't even matter what you descend it from because some people don't even care. Huh? Because nobody really believes that. And nobody believes that. I don't know of anybody who really believes that. <laughs> Especially in the science community. I don't know anybody who really believes that. And you, you had to be drinking some crazy Kool-Aid to, re to really truly believe that. And <laughs> uh -huh. Because if all that was true, it would still be happening. It would be, it would be ongoing. There's nothing that would shut those genes down to continue to express. You'd continually see it parallel, a continual evolution. We'd look at every state that they've described. Nobody truly believes that. No one. It's a religion. It is a religion. It's a philosophy that has turned into a religion. Reality of it is people, Satan is just like, okay, I can't convince them to renounce what it is that they, they, they've laid hold on. And so now I'm going to make them religious. Now I'm going to deceive them so that they can't really understand how to move forward with God. I'm going to blind them from the Word. 
I'm going to hide the word. I'm going I'm to fight against them. I'm going to stand there and I'm resisting them. I mean, the Lord said, bring Joshua, son of Josedek here. Bring him here and put the, put the robes upon him and put the, the crown upon him. He's going to stand before me now and I'm going to set him up and I'm going to anoint him here to be a ruler in Israel. And there was what was going on at the, at the very time God is doing all this. Satan stood there in Zechariah chapter 3 and he was resisting God and he was resisting Joshua and he's saying, no way, I'm not, gonna, I'm not letting you walk in this anointing. I'm not letting you have this power. I'm in charge around here. Satan's rebellious. You think he's obeying God? He's not. You think he believes God? He doesn't. He's a, he, is, he, he is a pathological liar. He believes his lie. He, 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 do you think that Satan believes you redeemed? The only person that believes you redeemed is Jesus. And the Father. It's no Satan, no powers of darkness believe that you redeemed. It's when you stand up and you begin to execute authority that this, suddenly they get, the, they get the memo. They get the news brief. Huh? Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? Eh? Because as far as I'm concerned, I'm your master. Because that's what Satan was saying with the sons of Sceva. Are you listening to me? It's time that you're going to stand out and be counted for. And the only way that you're going to even begin to get this is that you're going to pay attention to the word of the Lord. You're going to begin to understand some very fundamentals about what is sacred. And the Word of God teaches us about how the Holy Ghost moves, what the Holy Spirit does, what, how God feels about His presence, what God feels about the realms of holiness. And, he, and you're going to have to get a clue that He hasn't changed His mind. And that He's made your body His temple. And that you personally are, are a sacred place and a sacred person. Uh, he calls you a saint, a sanctified one, a sacred one, or a holy one. Wow. Would that ever be a breakthrough? And then he, then he demands you to come and uh, he demands us to come and submit ourselves to him in such a way that he can arrange us in whatever manner he chooses and he can do with us whatever he chooses and then nobody can wear a tag or a title saying, I am this or I am that. Nobody can do that. Uh-uh. Here in this church right now at this moment in time, I am functioning in pastoral ministries. That's what I'm doing. That's, what the Lord, that's how the Lord Jesus set me into his church. And so I'm ministering to you in that context. And by the, but, but beyond that, here we are, just every one of us yielded before the Lord just to be molded and first broken and, 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 and melted and then molded by him and then used by him. We want to be used by him. But we can't constantly say to the, we can't constantly say to the potter, we can't, say to the creator or to the former I don't want to be used that way use me this way I don't agree with that shaping I don't like my handle like that I, I don't want a handle there I don't want to be a round pot I want to be a square one huh I don't want to be no cup I want to be a basin what's up and if you can just grab a hold of what we were saying earlier before we spend a little bit of time worshiping if you just can grab a hold of the understanding that without the encounter, there is no understanding, there is no knowing him. Without the encounter, there is no way that you can begin to participate with these things. All there are is going to be words to you, concepts to you, that you can never cooperate with, and thus you have a token that you steal under the law and not been born again, if such is the state. Or you've been deceived and turned away from the covenant. Because you see all of those happening in the New Testament. And I don't want to think of that of anyone. Not in this place. I want to think of every one of you as a person that is here to now begin to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. To understand exactly how it is to move with God in the things that He's purposed us to do as His church. So He says here in Psalms chapter 89. In verse 7. God is greatly to be trembled before because actually not the word fear yara Hebrew language yara is the word fear this is an entirely different word this word it is a very difficult word to yaretsa to pronounce it's yaretsa yaretsa it's a tough word to pronounce it means to tremble to tremble or to be horrified or to be terrified but nobody wants to say be terrified before the presence of the Lord. So I'm going to dilute it a little bit better. I'm going to give it the, the easiest one I can give for Yatza. Huh? I'm going to give the easiest one I can give for this word. 
tremble. And so we know, and, and the reason, let me tell you why I justify that. Let me tell you why I do that. Because he said he would dwell with the broken and the contrite, those who tremble. Same word, tremble at his word. Eh? To tremble. Well, when's the last time you did that? Well, you don't understand. I just love him so much and he loves me. Well, if you did, you'd tremble. You'd tremble. Because he's talking to the holy ones. See the holy ones? He's talking to the assemble, the assembly of the holy ones. He's talking to the symbol of the assembly of the holy ones. In fact, in fact, most, most linguistic scholars believe, I don't agree with this. I mean, maybe it's just because I'm just not intelligent enough yet, but I don't agree with this on several respects, not just linguistically, I don't see enough proofs for it, but just from a context point of view, is I know that God has made us saints. He's made us holy ones. It, the, the Bible is written 64 times in the New Testament. We're called saints. We're called holy ones. We're not called Christians. One time we're called Christians in the, in the New Testament, and one time we're referred to Christians, uh, referred to as Christians in the New Testament. So a total of twice called Christians. The other, the majority of the time, 64 times, we're called saints or holy ones. So he's, so m- as I was going to say, many scholars and theologians, linguists, linguists especially, they believe that he's talking to the angels, the mighty angels here. Well, if the mighty angels need to be trembling, if the hills tremble, if all God's creation is pure, glorious, wonderful creation, beautiful creation, trembles at the presence of the Lord. What, what, what's going to happen? What, do, what needs to happen in our life for us to get this reverence back? Because I can tell you about the tremblers. I can tell you about the Quakers. I can tell you about the Shakers. My, my, my ancestors were Quaker preachers. They would tell you that the power of God came in such Holy Ghost conviction. They all trembled in the presence of the Lord. That's, and they, they shook under the presence of, of Holy Ghost conviction. There was such a terrifying presence as it were knowing, Paul said, knowing the terror of the Lord. Folks don't even have a context by which to even comprehend that in, in, in modern society. And it ought to be enough of an evidence for you and I to, to, to recognize it is a strategic thing that Satan has done and it's influencing everyone. Now, how are you going to get out from underneath the influence? You're going to have to become equipped by God, by the Spirit of the Lord, and by the Word of the Lord to become valiant enough to begin to functionally deal with it in your own personal lives. And then begin to bring that into the context of how we behave ourselves before him. And I don't even believe that we get to do that without an encounter. And that's why there's got to be an atmosphere and a place of an encounter. And we've got to have at least a couple of people that are going to get a hold of God so that we can begin to see a movement of a greater encounter. Yes. Praise God, he raises up people with an anointing to go and just do it and shake people's lives. But then we find out who's going to follow on to know the Lord. And revival after revival, we discovered that not a lot of people follow on to know the Lord. They were all excited to stand there in the presence of a mighty move of God. You can see it over and again when you're reasoning, right? In Joshua and Judges and, and Samuel, everybody's all up, all really just blessed by uh, this. Uh, Samson is a, a Jephthah, you know, a, a, a Shamgar. Somebody's been anointed by God that stands up and does some great thing. A David. But they don't follow on and know the Lord. They're just all in the, you know, they're just all in the excitement and fantasy of the moment, as it were. Huh? What about the movings of God? Can the movings of God take you to a place where you now hungry and thirsty? Can the movings of God shake you to a place to where that now you begin to say, okay, everything about my life, I'm conforming. I'm, Father, I want to, I will to participate with being conformed to the image of the Son. I will to participate with you, Holy Spirit, so you can do everything you want to do in me. That's where everything changes about your life. You sound different. You pray different. You sing different. You act different. You look different. You feel different. Amen. Uh-huh. He says, he says, tremble. Remember, don't ever forget it. Heaven is my throne. The earth is my footstool. You know, you're going to build a house for me? The heavens of heavens can't contain me. But this is what I'll do. The person who's broken and contrite. Jesus says, come and learn of me. I'm broken and contrite. It's the same as meek and lowly. I'm broken and contrite. If you want to have this kind of relationship with Father, you're going to have to understand how to be broken. You're going to have to understand how to be, be, be made lowly. 
brought into this place and this atmosphere of humility that only the Holy Spirit can minister to us because our society, our culture despises such, looks down on that. There, there's no promotion for the broken and the contrite. <laughs> it don't fit in our philosophy of the survival of the fittest. Those are the genes not selected. The stuff et up. Are you with me? It, it permeates every dimension of our lives, and yet we can't see it. It is the movings of God, but yet we can't discern it. And if we could, we wouldn't go with the other stuff that constantly is influential and does have a radical impact upon our assemblies and our congregation. <laughs> and thus, our interaction with God the Holy Ghost who wants to pour out and who's not holding back nothing, who's not restrained anything, who's ready to save all of San Diego, who's ready to show forth his power to all of Southern California and throw Tijuana in the pot with it. Amen. Amen. And it doesn't take much. It doesn't take much of the movings of God to shake this whole region. And all we got to do is start, just start getting real. Huh? And now, you know, it just really comes down to me. It's like this. Father, I, I just ask you to forgive me for my lack of love for you. See, the Lord said, you'll ask me and I'll do anything you ask. But he said by the prophet Isaiah, I asked you and you did nothing I asked. That's what he said. And then we just simply can't go, come into this place. He says, he says, I want a relationship with you. And I've ordained you and given you this place with me that I'll do whatever you ask. Whatever you ask me, I'll do it. But then Father's looking for reciprocation in that love. That whatever he asks us, we'll do it. I, I just basically, I find myself saying, Father, forgive me for my lack of love. Uh, forgive me for my lack of devotion. Forgive me for my lack of submission to you. Holy Spirit, I want to be yielded to you. Shine the floodlight of heaven upon my soul and show me those areas, Lord, that I don't even understand. I don't have the capacity. I'm telling you, the wisest man on the face of the earth doesn't have the intellect to understand anything about God. And that's a big step forward for you. When all of a sudden, anything you're going to know, you're going to receive by the grace of God from the Holy Ghost. And that's going, to be because you, that's going to be because you want it more than anything else. But what happens is just the opposite. A counter influence is running that has got you thinking that you are so bright and that you know and that you can figure it out. And by the way, you have the Bible in front of you and you can, you, just you and the Bible can get her done. I'm telling you, praise God for the Word, but the Holy Spirit retains all rights to revelation. He's the one who opens up our eyes to behold wondrous things. It's still the encounter. I know people who can quote the Bible and learned it very at an early age and can tell you every parse, every one of the seven form, verb forms in the Hebrew language and tell you where they exist in the Old Testament and they have nothing to do with the working and moving of the Holy Ghost. They know nothing about the ways of the Holy Ghost and the movings of the Spirit. They're not right with God. They're stuck in their religious ditch. Orthodox Jews and even Reformed Jews who just are devoted to the Word. I mean, their religion is knowing the Word. That's it. So the more you study the Bible, the more righteous you become. So the more you know about the Every word, every single word, every single phrase. <laughs> I mean, there's, 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 he, there's minds in the Hebrew community can almost sit down and just start not quoting the words, but quoting the letters from Genesis 1-1 to the end of 2 Chronicles. That's pretty radical, eh? And that that's the right thing to be doing with a brilliant mind. We'd struggle to quote the words. Because to them, every letter is God-breathed. And it has a symbol of something that would ultimately cause them to step over into the divine. And to find a place of being worthy, to be fully accepted and into a place of oneness with the Almighty. To sit down at the table and break bread with Him. Father has given it to us as a gift. Father has given oneness to us as a gift. 
That's why Paul gave himself to that kind of a righteous living, to that kind of a commitment to ultimately step, to be worthy, to sit at the table of the Father. And that's, he gave himself, he said, concerning the law, I was blameless. Concerning the righteousness of the law, I was perfect in it. I gave myself wholly devoted to it. Zeal, I persecuted the church. What happened was I saw a greater righteousness on the road to Damascus. I saw the righteousness of God, which is exceedingly greater than the righteousness of the law. People in modern day church contexts and Gentile contexts can't even begin to comprehend that. They're somehow stuck in this idea that somehow the blood of Jesus Christ has made sin okay with God. And it didn't. The blood of Jesus washed it away. Holiness came and swallowed up. The contagion of holiness came and swallowed up the death. Hallelujah. Life swallowed up death. Hallelujah. Su Mongraya. Holiness swallowed up sin and iniquity. Pokorasataya. So that we stand right now before God having no sin, no iniquity, no offense. Blameless. I mean, where, where God presents us before himself, faultless. I mean, a beautiful thing. He's looking at you and me saying, okay, this is what I've done for you. Now, is anybody going to participate? And then you start talking about participating, and everybody starts getting all freaky. Oh, he's condemning us. Oh, he's putting too much pressure on us. Oh, come on. Can't you see the strategies of Satan? at work against the advancement in the kingdom of God. Don't you understand? You've been brought into a great army, a fierce, ferocious army, described by the prophet Joel. It's not coming in a day in the future. The day is here right now. We are ready, that army. I already got a face like a lion. I'm already outrunning every man on foot because I'm, I'm like a horse. The fastest known creature that men interacted with for transportation. Now, I mean, you could just take it up another notch if you wanted to. And what is the fastest aircraft on the planet? And say, that's what you are. But I'm going to go with, listen, <laughs> they run like the horses. I'm going to go with the scripture. We run like the horses. We're not slowing up for nothing. I got a horse that you get on her back. She will scare you. Her, her, one of her ancestors still holds the fastest um, record on the dirt mile track ever. And you get on her back, she's pushing it way out there. You're going to, I don't care how good of a horseman you are, you're going you're gonna to go, you're going to be shocked to start with. Ooh, this girl gets up and goes. Huh? Look, she's not playing around. <laughs> Neither is he. Neither should we be playing around. It ain't about just, you know, tiptoeing around and, and just kind of walking around. Who wants to be on some little, you know, sway back, can't hardly move horse anyways? <laughs> can't, you kick the thing and it's going nowhere. Nobody wants that. I mean, I guess if a fearful person who's never ridden a horse before, huh? Maybe they want to be on that. Come on, people. Come on. Papa has opened up a wide opportunity of unlimited grace and unlimited interaction with him. And he, there is therefore now no condemnation for us. There's no reason to have a sense of sin or offense. There we have the privilege of coming on in in a way that it just, it defies anything that we could possibly even reckon with. But we're just going to have to learn the principles here because we, we just don't got it. And when we do, when we, when, we, when we get it, and Father's the purpose that we get it, then we will have the inspiration and the wherewithal to stand up against all the influences that are st trying, or in, in many ways, effectively keeping God's people from moving with God. Those influences of pride, those influences of wanting it our own way, the imaginations that would stand in the way, the sense of competition, which there's, people don't realize this, but there's nothing competitive about God. Competition was born in the worship of Greek deities. The Olympics were all about worshiping Greek deities, Greek gods. Okay, we're high on competition in our culture and wouldn't know how to deal with any of it. For sure, we're going to be playing football, NFL, uh, uh, you know, uh, I mean, you know, you know, God's got a favorite team, you know, come on. It's just this, the, our mentality of what really is the kingdom of God is about, what the nature of God is about, is, is, it is messed up. So then you say, well, you know, I don't have any problem with the competition. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. 
Yeah, you do. You're competing all the time. Most of your offense comes out of your competition thing. Comparing yourself with other people. Not feeling like you measured up. I just don't feel like I measure up. All my life I've been told I didn't measure up. You need to get over yourself. If you didn't encounter God, that won't matter anymore. You step in the beauty and the splendor of brokenness and humility, and that won't even matter anymore. Huh? Because all you'll be talking about is going up. All you'll be talking about is whatever. Listen, T, I want to learn more about humility. Then all of a sudden, the bad things you've been through, you'll be going, wow, man, those things could work humility and brokenness in my life if I would let them. Uh-oh. Well, that really is getting deep, isn't it? Huh? That's going a little bit too far. We, we had to back, let's back it out back where we were, okay? And, and just two hands for beginners. Let's find, another, let's find another approach here and just begin to understand just the simplicity of this. Father is here to rewrite everything about your life right now. Clean slate, forget about yesterday. Clean slate, forget about yesterday. Doesn't matter what you've been, who you are, what your genealogies are, Holy Ghost is here to influence you, empower you, overwhelm you, lead you, guide you, take control of your life. And it's the same as he did and beyond anything he did with Elijah. Potentially. In a safe assumption that Elijah, Elijah was not baptized in the Holy Ghost, which is a safe assumption. Huh? Even though he's been standing in the presence of the Lord now for 2,600 years, or thereabout. 26,500, or something like that. 2,650 years or so. Maybe it's more like 2,658 2, years or something like that. Is that right? 68 years. Huh? 2,600 and. Right? Is that, is that right? That's right, isn't it? Yeah, 68. Does everybody say yes? yes? Okay, good. You're just agreeing, right? I'm close. It's in the sixes, upper sixes. Yeah? Yeah, it is. Amen. Father, could we, could we experience a little bit of that? Could, could, could we begin to be broken enough by revelation of what you're having to deal with in your church today to where that we're saying, Father, we're not going to participate with that shaming your name anymore and dishonoring your name? Huh? If I told you everything that I know, even firsthand, that is going on among church leaders today, you'd be busted. But you know, I don't need to say that for you to get bested. The Holy Ghost could show you how messed up things are. Where we send our monies. Many of you will send their monies. And yet how messed up it is. Morally messed up. No, I'm not talking about doctrinally. Just talking morally. Because doctrine is no measure. What you, what you say that you believe in the Bible is no measure for who you really are. Because God's more interested in orthopraxy, not orthodoxy. Uh, in order orthodoxy he's more interested in what you do he was more interested in how he, he's not interested in us being right he's interest, interested in us doing right and we always want to be right we always want to I'm right you're wrong it's not about being right huh come on now the Lord says tremble before us he says this is what he is what Papa says he says God is greatly to be trembled before in the assembly of his saints. Where are you at right now? Uh, can I say this again? God is greatly, God <clears throat> is greatly to be trembled before in the assembly of his saints. I mean, I'm just going to have to, you're just going to have to get honest with me. And get honest with yourself. As you text message and do these other things and get distracted and walk in and out of the building and whatever else. When's the last time you trembled in the church? Just be honest. And then you have to say, oh, you have to say, okay, Father, what's going on in my life? I want to change. Because whatever you've asked of me, you've empowered me to do it. I want to understand why it is I am so aloof from what your word describes I should be doing if I were under the influence of the Holy Ghost. Because that's what the Word of God is doing. 
Huh? I, I, you know, I, once again, I believe, I believe all of this is a result of an encounter. And, and, you know, in the beginning of the meeting tonight, I described to you the encounter. You know, all, the, all of Israel read about God. But Moses experienced him. He encountered him. As a result, Moses knew God. And there was an interaction going down. Everybody who read about God, there was no interaction. They didn't know him. Well, they had an interaction with God. They didn't like it. They thought, you know know why? Self-preservation. We're going to die. Did you know that your philosophies and your belief system can actually keep you from wanting to continue on with an encounter with God? Oh, God, you've got to leave or I'm going to die. And they had a philosophy. They had a philosophical belief. Their ideologies were such that if you saw an angel or if you saw God, that means you were dying. Huh? That's, you see that again? Huh? And again in the scripture. That would keep you, your, your belief system and your ideas will keep you from an encounter with God and even stop an encounter while you're, that you're having. And you won't, you, you will refuse to continue on in it. That's crazy, isn't it? Well, does that, does that have any place to work in your life? Does your influences and your belief system have a place to begin to impact and shut down an encounter that you're actually having with God and it shuts it down? Huh? Have you ever had the move of God shut down in your life? Yes, you have. I have. And I'm like, Lord, what happened? I'm just in this silver woman presence of the Lord. And the Spirit of the Lord began to show me because I asked, what happened? Wait, what took place? And the Lord began to show me where I began to engage in wrong thinking. You mean the Holy Ghost is that sensitive? Yeah, he is. I began to engage in wrong attitude. I mean, I'm going to tell you right now, unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace is a big spiritual law that can't be violated. Huh? Father teaching us how to just rest in his presence and how to be confident in his love for us is a, is a, is a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful and glorious thing where, you know, I've been under the glory of God and all of a sudden, you know, get a little bit um, over anxious about the whole thing and as it were, shut the move of God down. The Lord just tell me, look, just relax. Just relax. Just quit trying to, just quit, quit trying so hard. Just interact with me. You're, you're still interacting with people. <laughs> have you ever noticed that you noticed it about yourself and other people they start praying they're not pr- talking to father they're preaching a sermon are you with me huh because they're still interacting with people around them it's hard it's, it's an encounter God, with God that allows you to shut everything out in a public place allows you to shut everything out hallelujah it's a different sound to it too <laughs> hallelujah Father, we, we want to tremble before your presence. We want to understand what this means. This is what you've asked us to do. You said that, that, that you'd come and dwell with those who are broken, contrite, and tremble at your word. Well, the beautiful thing of it is we know he dwells with us because we have the habitation of the Holy Ghost. He just gifted us with all of these things. Now, but did, did we do, did, 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 because he's gifted us with all these things, did, then do we just abandon what his word said? Or do we understand what his word says to where it becomes a principle and a part of our lives, where we participate with that? Huh? To say, okay, I've got, he's coming, he's dwell, he's coming, he's gifted me, he dwells here with me. Praise God. Now, I want to learn a reverence and a respect to be able to benefit more greatly from this habitation. This working. I want to understand. I want to I learn a reverence and a respect so that I can be more yielded and more submitted to the Father. Oh, Lord, he says, God is greatly to be trembled before in the assembly of his saints and he's to be held in fear by all them who are about him. Yara is the Hebrew word there. It's a much easier word to pronounce. Yara. It's fear. And it's a fear. Somebody said, oh, well, it's reverence. Well, it's Yara, Yara is Yara, is Yara. If you're in front of a lion, it's Yara. If you're um, getting ready to be run over by a chariot, it's Yara. If you're running for your life, it's Yara. If you're on the night of Passover and everybody's dying around you and you're afraid, it's Yara. So it's fear. Are you with me? 
They were greatly a fear. They were not greatly irreverenced. <laughs> but we didn't. We, we don't have a. It's hard for us to understand. Well, wait a minute. You, you're messing me up. You're messing me up. You're telling me about trembling before and having fear towards someone who I'm supposed to believe loves me. And then I'm supposed to have a love relationship. Yeah, it's all messed up, isn't it? In the realms of human thinking. But it's perfect over in the realms of the divine thinking. Because it's emotions, it's knowing the terror of the Lord. We thus persuade men. I'm, I'm, I've actually had an opportunity of being in the presence of the Lord in such a way to where I felt hit a holy fear that caused me to tremble with great quakings, with great fear, and be overwhelmed with the beauty and splendor of his love all at the same time. Try those emotions on. Where can you find emotion? Where can you access that kind of emotion? Anywhere in the world. You can't. But what happens is we interact with God. We interact, we actually have emotions. God accesses, as it were, emotions. We're impacted with emotions that nothing else in the natural world could ever elicit. There's no interaction like that. It's either fear, right? I'm afraid. I'm running for my life. I'm going to be, I'm going to be killed if I don't get out of here quickly. Fear, yara. Or it's love. I feel wonderful. This is beautiful. This is glorious. Huh? I just feel so peaceful and so safe and secure, right? That's right. Well, when it's with Father, it's both at the same time, and it's awesome. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. And you're just going to have to have an encounter. With him to understand. Huh? Just imagine. Just imagine the one who loves you. The one who loves you so much. And all heaven is, and earth flees away from him. And there's no place for them to hide. Imagine when you're standing there. And what did Moses say? I did exceedingly quake and tremble. That's what he said, isn't it? Right? Hebrews chapter 12 once again. I shook and trembled. I was overwhelmed. But what was he also doing? Full of joy and ecstasy. Can you imagine that? No. Because there's nothing you can encounter in this world that could elicit that kind of emotion response. God alone has access to those kinds of realms in your life. It's time to come on over into another realm. There's another realm. Everybody knows it. Everybody's going to tell you the truth. They know there's something after death. There's another thing going on. I'm going to tell you right now. They want to call it a higher power. There's no higher power. It's just God. Uh, well, there is a higher power. Satan's a higher power than humanity. Demons are a hum higher power than humanity in that sense. They can elicit the power over men. Huh? So any other higher power that's referred to outside of Jesus Christ, it is talking about demon spirits. I know, that goes over great, you know. <laughs> But it's true. Now look at this. You've got to understand this in the context of verse 14. Look at this. Look at this. Here's what you've got to understand. And this, I'm going to drive this point home, and, 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 and I'm probably going to leave it here. Justice and judgment are your habitation. This is why he's not putting up with the nonsense. He's not going to put up with the iniquity. He's not going to put up with the rebellion. He's not going to put up with Jezebel t taking and destroying the prophets of the Lord so that every, he, she can influence the men, men's hearts to now worship an idol of stone. That she's going to name Yehoah. She's going to make a head of a bull and the body of a man man she's going to name him after the same name of almighty god and blaspheme god's name and then give him a, a prostitute named ashtaroth not a wife a prostitute and papa's supposed to be okay with that live and let live <laughs> nonsense man these the, the powers of darkness are, are corrupting everything and turning people's hearts away from what is truth and real and love and life and mercy and goodness and grace huh 
And then they're going to be defiant against the servants of the Lord with all re- dear, irreverence and disrespect. Well, that's the other side. That's swinging the pendulum. But reality of it is, is I'm just calling you and me into question. I'm calling us into question. Where is our reverence? Where is our fear of the Lord? Because looky here, Papa's not going to pollute judgment. Look at this. Justice and judgment are thy habitation of thy throne. Mercy and truth shall go before your face. The fear of the Lord is clean. It's good. It's right. In every every respect, it's right. Blessed are the people that know the joyful sound of it, too. Let me, let me just read this first scripture. It just came to me quickly. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17. The Lord says, you know, of course, he says, verse 15. He says, but as he is, which has called you is holy, be ye holy in all manner of life, in every manner of conversation, in all of your behavior. Okay? Are you with me? Everybody with me? Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without respect of person judges every man according to his work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. And, and it is an awesome awareness that God's judgment against sin and iniquity is without partiality. Father's not going to say, well, I'm going to let you get away with it and wink at it because I like you. Meanwhile, over here, I'm going to execute my judgment against it. All sin, God will destroy. It's how bad it is. This is why you've got to grab a hold of this verse of Scripture here in Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13. This says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Why don't you go over there quickly? And then I'm going to give people, a, I'm going to give people an opportunity to get right with God in here. If you're not right with God, I'm going to give you an opportunity to get right with God. I'm going to give you an opportunity to come be touched by the blood of Jesus Christ. And amen. And I pray that, it, I pray that it's warm to you. It's not cold and lifeless. It's living. And I, I pray that you understand the sacrifice that Father paid. That is, that is, that is terrible. I mean, the, I mean, I tremble at the thought of it. The Father's saying, look, I offered my son for you. And you rejected him. I offered my son for you. And you did despite against grace and trampled his blood underfoot. I'm fear before him. I'm going to just, I'm going to fear before him. I'm going to bring, I'm going to allow every one of my actions and everything that I think and everything that I do, I'm going to allow it to be brought into perspective of what Father has to say about it because he's a God of judgment and justice and truth. And he's not going to, and again, not going to go for just sneaking around. With the harlot who hates him, with the, with the powers of darkness, whose purpose is to destroy everything that belongs to him. In Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, and arrogancy, the evil way. So you can't, you know, if I've got the fear of the Lord, and where does the fear of the Lord come from? The fear of the Lord is the spirit of the Lord, right? So just hold your finger right there because I want to say something about this. I just want you to see this. I want you to see this in Isaiah chapter 11. Go look in Isaiah chapter 11 to show you this real quickly. The fear of the Lord is a part of the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And it's described concerning the anointing that Jesus had. Verse 2, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. So Jesus had the fear of the Lord. Jesus had the fear of Yehovah, which is, Yehovah refers to the Father, whom we call Father God. Do you understand that? So we come back over here, and we say, we understand that the fear of the Lord is, is to hate evil, is to hate pride, to hate arrogance, to hate ev- the evil way. The forward mouth do I hate. And we already had established that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, so I'll, all of a sudden I say, okay, 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 okay. Okay, Father, fear of the Lord is beginning in wisdom. And I know that without the fear of the Lord, I know without wisdom, I'm going to justify sin. I need the wisdom, I need the, which will bring the encounter with God, a special activity of the Holy Ghost in my life, which is a special activity that every one of us have received. As many as received His Spirit and has the Spirit of the Lord. 
So, Lord, I want to give all attendance to hating these things. So how can, so, Lord, give me insight so that I can ultimately identify evil. I can identify sin. Sin is not, sin is not missing the mark. That is a misnomer. Sin is treason against God's nature and ways. It's, it's treason. It's a violation against his very life. And exi- it, is a, it is an act of hostility against his very existence. It's not just something, I, oh, we trip into more or less every day because God knows. God doesn't know that. God doesn't know that you're supposed to sin every day. God knows that he's given you a way of escape. Hallelujah. That you may bear it. God knows that he's giving you the spirit of holiness that would overwhelm you and flood your heart and soul. But all those lies that would try to elicit its effect in your thinking in your body would not be able to work. The fear of the Lord, the trembling of God, trembling before his presence, being in awe and fear of who he is. Brings in an awareness to us to depart from iniquity because at that will burn in hell forever. Now Hollywood wants to make a mockery out of that. So Hollywood's taken the crazy guy and he's casted the, cra- casted the crazy person, the person who's going to always be the, um, the hypocrite or got some other thing going on behind the scene, you know, living a dual existence. And he's the one who's crying out concerning the wrath of God. And, of course, we know that Satan has strategically worked to distort the minds of men and pervert the minds of men to such a powerful medium. Mm -mm -mm. There's only one way to escape here, dear people, and it's by the deliverer of Christ Jesus. There's only one way to have our minds renewed. It's by the washing of the water of the Word. It is by the working of the floods of the Holy Spirit being allowed to fill us up and flow through us. Sitting around and thinking through the matter with yourself ain't going to get you nowhere. Sitting around and, and, and posting pictures on everybody who ever offended you and did you wrong and what you thought they should have done different is only going to land you in hell. Believe me. Because it's going to work bitterness and unforgiveness and resentment in your life. It is. God's calling us to a place of encounter with Him. And when we talk about tremble before Him, all ye His saints, we're talking about the people that are gathered around Him in the assembly. We're talking about people that are having an encounter. Because you really can't without that. So I want to, I'm asking you to come into a place of crying out to God, saying, Father, I thank you for what, what the, the movings of your spirit in my life. But I don't want to just stop along the way over here with what man says is okay within religion. Where everybody's saying, calm down, calm down. You're getting too radical here. We just recently, I recently had a report of a guy who said, he came and he said, I'm telling you. He said, I've never been in a church meeting like this. I watched a guy came. I watched the guy come. He came for a little over a month. And he was just there, there so hungry, was in every altar call. He said, I've never been in a place like this. I've never realized you could walk with God like this. I've never had an encounter like this. I've never heard a message like this. I want all in. And then the person that brought him ultimately said, well, I don't want all in. Because I still like the nightclubs. I still still like going and dancing and whatever else. I still like having fun. Sad. Because there's a lot of people who still want to have fun. Well, I mean, I would categorically put the people that are having fun in a better position than the people who are just stubborn. You know what I'm saying? And they don't want to change. And they're in the church and they want to change and this is what I believe and this is what I think and I don't care what anybody says. Because that's... You want to go after all of them. Evil, pride, right? Arrogance, the forward mouth, the person who speaks forward things, boastful things, you know. Well, I don't agree with them. Well, you used to get yourself a microphone and go preach. 
Better yet, why don't you just do this? Why don't you get yourself a sensor? Because if you could, that's what I would do. That's what I would do. I'm not kidding you. That's what I would do. That's what I would do. Because an encounter with God makes you understand this automatically. I was standing with a man of God one night. We, he just got finished preaching. It probably was, must have been 5,000 people. He comes back and he says to me, he says, well, you think, I, is there anything I should have done different? I said, are you kidding me, man? I have nothing to say. God's anointed you. I have no right to touch that. Are you kidding me? I'm like, Lord, are you testing me? <laughs> uh, I have nothing to say. It isn't in the, even in the, it is not even in the framework of human judgment. Somebody said, but we can all prophesy and every one of us judge. Yeah, that's fine. That's different. That's different. We're not talking about each person prophesying and other judges. We're talking about the person God anointed to declare his word. With, and anointed with mighty signs and wonders to prove it. Kind of thing. I fear and tremble before him. Father, this is yours. This is your business. Now, I want us to be able to grab a hold of God and just start saying, Father, we need to understand how to get out of the profane and into the sacred in the way that we think. We've got to get out of the profane and into the sacred in the way that we interact with holy things, the things that belong to worship and singing and praise and prayer and the, and the ministry of your word. And what happens when people are being called by the Lord and they're coming up and there's a moving of the Holy Ghost up here in this area and then back in the back people are sitting doing whatever they're it is that they're doing. I mean, you can... You know, there's been too many things that have gone on in the past that are not pretty picture. Ooh. And we, we just want to come to recognize, wait a minute, I'm in, I'm in his presence. I'm standing on holy ground. Huh. Ooh, karasati yepataya. Arasatiya. So we're just, I'm, I'm just standing before the Lord. And, I'm, and it's really, come, come on, people. All I'm, all I'm talking about is I'm talking about a hunger and a thirst to have a greater encounter with Him. So I, what I do is I don't say, okay, I'm going to change myself. I, here's what I do. Here's my reaction. I say, Father, I want to be able, please allow me to come into a greater expression of interaction with you. Come in, allow me, Lord, to step into a greater dimension of interacting with you of standing in your presence. Lord, I'm willing to... Now, with that, the, Lord's, the Lord tells us, well, there's some things I want you to correct. Because huh? I'm really hungry. Okay, Lord, what do I need to do? What is it that you want me to correct? Sometimes it's forgiving people. The Lord says, I'll do anything for you, whatever you ask, but then he says, but, but, you know, right there in Mark chapter 11, but, <laughs> if you've got unforgiveness, you go make that right. Sometimes it's just the Lord coming back to us and saying, no, 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 no. I told you how to, I told you how to handle holy things. I mean, it's like this. The Lord says, men do well with your wives according to knowledge, lest your prayers be hindered. So, you know, once again, we can be crying out, oh, God, Father, I, I just want to have that greater encounter. I want to know you in a, in, in a more radical way, in a more personal way to where I can be more conscious of who you are and, and experience these things from the heart that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to grab a hold of with my head that goes beyond my intellect to really put together. And the Lord says, wait, you're treating your wife wrong. She's sacred. She's my daughter. You're not dealing with her properly. And it can be the other way around, too. You could be saying these things, and the Lord said, no, you rebel. You're rebe rebelling against your husband. You won't submit to him. Rebellion in the house causes all kinds of things to go crazy, go upside down. Mm -mm -mm. I just want the whole, I just want the fire of God to come and burn in such a way that the holiness of God, that the sacredness of God is something that we are aware of, not trying to figure out, not trying to mentally ascend unto. Huh. But we're aware of that. Now, if that, is a, if that becomes a cry of our heart, that becomes the plea of our mouth, if that becomes the consecration of our conduct so that the Word of God is instructing us in exactly where to do, here's the protocol, here's what I want you to do. 
as it were. Here's how I want you to handle my stuff. Here's how I want you to interact with me. Ananias and Sapphira fell down dead as a witness to all the church. Even as much as the fifty were company of fifty were consumed with by fire as a witness to all of Israel. Judgments in Father's house haven't gone anywhere. Still here. And when all of a sudden I came to recognize, wait a minute, we're under the judgment of the Lord. When I came to understand, the church is under the judgment of the Lord. So there's a restriction. And I'm like, oh, God, no, 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 no. See, when I understood that, then it's all like, oh, now it's, it's touching something deep. And now it's touching something deep. I'm going, oh, God, please, Father, forgive us. Lord, show me how not to reproduce that in my life. Show me how not to participate with that that has brought us under this judgment, this, as it were, divine restraint. Look, you know what? Tell me, is the name of the Lord Jesus a byword in the earth? It is a token of judgment. Where his name becomes a byword and a swear word and a cuss word. Huh? Where they go by, they pass by and they wag their head. Huh? It's true. Concerning the church and the Lord Jesus. Jesus' name taken in vain continually. Even by some of his own people. Profanities. I, the person was telling me, a man of God was telling me the other day. He said, yeah, I was there. Um, or, or, a very close friend of his was there when a particular preacher died. And actually, actually, I was told the story, almost two different stories by two different guys. One, both of them were, were secondhand witnesses to this, but they were secondhand witnesses to the people that were there. Two men of God died. Two different men of God died, died. And on their deathbed, they're both preaching sermons and swearing at God and cussing him out and telling him that he should be damned to hell. Yeah. No, no, I'm not kidding. People living dual lives. And that's the way they died. They died as they lived. Pretty, pretty radical, isn't it? How can that be, you say? You don't have to be careful. You can't mess with the sacred things of God. Believe me, Satan wants to turn the whole thing around. You believe me. He's got it in his, he has it in his realm of thinking that he can turn it all around and he can overthrow God. And he can rule. So much, well, he was defeated 2,000 years ago at the cross. Sure he was. He don't believe that, though. So you're going to see what he's going to do in the tribulation. At the bottom of Armageddon. And then he's going to be cast into hell and he's going to be bound for a thousand years. And guess what's happened? The Lord's going to loose him. And just for, as soon as, he, as soon as he's loose, for just as soon as he's loose for a little season, he starts gathering everybody together to go fight against God. He's in a war against God. And this is all about a war against God. This is all about an attack against life. This is all about a defiance against the power and the person of the, of the living God. Father's looking for some valiant men and some valiant women that are going to stand up. Who are going to get some wisdom and some insight because they're sitting in the presence of the Lord and ministering unto Him. Mm -mm -mm. When I first discovered that the church wasn't much different from judges, it just broke me. It just broke me. Father raises up deliverers, you know. And there comes a great moving of the Spirit of God. And a liberty and a flow of the Spirit happens once again. And miracles and signs and wonders. And people are delivered from demon possessions and torments. And sickness and disease and affliction. And a great coming in of a harvest takes place. Because he raises up a deliverer. And then all of God's people should have f followed in behind it and marched straight into line and gone on to know the Lord. But they didn't. They scattered and became denominations. The rise of denominations took place right after one of the great revivals of the early 1700s. It's true. Jesus help us. And it seemed like every great move of God, great move of God, took place in, in 1906. This is the street. What happened out of it? Assemblies of God helped when it came in 1916. Just before that, the church of God solidified itself that much more separate. A lot of that was based over race, not just doctrine, preferences, 
It's crazy stuff that's going on. Praise God, there were still wonderful men of God <laughs> holding, holding, uh, the, 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 put it, keeping the press on for the advancement of, of the movings of God so that there was still that great flowing of the Spirit of God in the camp of the Pentecostal movement. But that's by and large gone. The strong, thunderous, prophetic preaching, signs and wonders, miracle ministry. Well, I'm telling you right now, when you get touched by it and you reckon with it and you're moved by it, your prayer changes. Your passion changes. You're going, no way. I, I've seen. I know. I'm not going to let it stand. I'm going to get up here. I'm going to shout. I'm going to put the trumpet to my mouth. I'm going to say this is the way it's going to be in Jesus' name by the word of the Lord. I'm going to give everything I have to participating with the Holy Ghost. To see this thing change. To see la suporana, a deliverance come. And an opportunity for God's people to all now uh, join ranks. Solidarity is a powerful force to contend with. But what is unity? <laughs> if solidarity in a human world is a powerful force to contend with, what is unity in the realm of the divine power of God? It's an unstoppable force. It'll roll over this world in, 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 in a year. In a very short season. It would do more and accomplish more than Alexander the Great did under an angel of darkness ruling him and empowering him. God's power. Somebody said Satan can conquer the world in seven years during the tribulation. Well, what can God do? The problem is that Satan can rally himself an army. The question is, can God? Because he's forcing nobody. Satan's going to grab you and force you. He's going to hunt men. He hunts men. He hunts the souls of men with sin to destroy them. To put them under the yoke of slavery. All that Nimrod was was a man showing the very nature of Satan, personifying it. We've seen men personify it. We've seen the evil men of the ages like the Hitlers of the ages. Many of other evil men that we could name. It's personified. Personifications of demon spirits and the activity of Satan to oppress and destroy men. God in his love and his mercy has held back some of the great oppression that has existed over the past 2,000 years. Because of a church that pled, at, pled and cried and, and interceded for, 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 the, for the souls of men in a little place called the United States of America. And where are we at now? Well, I'm believing God that because it's gone so far now that people are going to wake up out of their sleep. The rise of God as in the days of old, as in the generations of the past. Oh, God, for you the one who broke and destroyed Rahab. And wounded the head of the dragon. Now you know Rahab means defiant. It was a, it's, a, it's an alternate name for Egypt. I'm quote, quoting the prophet Isaiah. If you didn't realize that. When God begins to move, he's going to attack defiance. He's going to come out against defiance that would hold his people in bondage. The influence, not just, a, not just a personification of a Pharaoh, an influence. An influence. Each man to his place. Each man to his station, in Jesus' name. Arise to the battlement. Put on the whole armor of God. Arise to your station now. And as Nehemiah said, and as Ezra commanded, with one hand have your trowel and the other your weapon. Be ready to build and fight at the same time. Because there's no way that this restoration is going to take place unless people have totally given themselves to the cause of both building and both re reconstruction and warfare. Let me just say this. 
If everybody who came to this ministry, who was called to this ministry, stayed, there'd be more than a thousand people here. I'm talking about the people that came here, called here, said they would never, never leave. I'm talking a thousand. I'm talking, I'm talking core people. I'm not talking about peripheral. Because I mean, a, a couple of years ago, I guess it was probably 2006, you know, they were making a, a distribution letter and there was like, you know, 550 people on the distribution letter that was paying, giving in tithes at that time into the ministry. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the people who were core people committed to this church. It would be over a thousand people. Each one of them called by God to be valiant men and women. There's no question about it. The cry, if every one of them went through a testing, every one of them went through a testing. If everyone, if they were all being trained to be radical, to cry out to God, to make intercession, to stand between the dead and the living, to stand between this place that we now are in as the church and where God has called us to be. And over and again, they were offended. Over and again, they didn't pass the test. I'm just saying, imagine a thousand people over the past 30 years lifting up their voice, crying out to God, passionately determined to stand together with one voice. Whoa. And of course it wouldn't be over the past 30 years because this would be a collection of time. So it would have at least been over the past 15 years. Then revival and the move of God would have definitely already come. So when I talk about hastening the, hastening the coming of the Lord, advancing it, speeding it up, well, just think about the participation, the responsibility that we have. Huh? Praise God for everybody that's here and for everybody that's, that's with us tonight and, and that is with us here in, in, in the ministry. Praise God. Now, understand, you can step this thing up. You can hasten this thing. You can say, okay, Lord, I want to understand how to step back into Pentecost. I want to step back into the freedom and the flow of what takes place when you raise up deliverance for your people no longer to live under the judgment of restraint because of, of, of sin and iniquity and defiance and irreverence. Huh? I want to, we want to live over here under the, under the liberty and the freedom of the fullness, ex, full expression of the Holy Ghost where we're not violating the things of the Spirit, where we're not profaning the name of Jesus. Do you know how, do you know how precious the name of Jesus is? He's protective of it. It's sacred to him. He's, it's his boast. He's going to glorify it. You think he's going to allow his glory once again to be shamed and reproached? No, he's not. Now, therefore, you and I are going to have to begin to have that kind of a zeal and that kind of a passion where the Lord says, I'm not going to participate with profaning his name. I'm not going to participate with shaming his name. I'm going to come to understand what it means to bring glory and honor to his name. That's what the Holy Spirit is here for. That's what the sacred Holy Ghost is here for. Why everybody stand with me? Now, Here's, here's, what's, here, here's, what we, here's, here's what we preached tonight to you. I just want you to understand exactly what we preached. We, in pre, we preached tonight a holy reverence, learning a holy reverence and sacredness of what God has done and what He's doing right here in your lives and here, especially in the midst of His church. The New Testament is about how to behave yourself in the house of the Lord. Why? So the things of God can be made manifest in the earth. God can do the things he's purchased, purposed to do through the church. But I want you to understand the conclusion of the matter. It's only going to be a living reality based upon our encounter with the Father. And so what I hear the Lord saying is he's calling us to a greater encounter. He's saying, come on in. He, he thought he'll stop by in Capitolia. He's not saying to anyone, stay out. But he's letting you know, he's letting you know, I'm going to tell you right now, he's letting you know there's a cherubim standing there. He's about 40 foot tall. He's got a face of an ox, a face of a lion, a face of a man. He's got a, a face of an eagle. He's got four arms, and, and he's got a sword coming out. Uh, and under, uh, uh, he's got four hands coming out of four, uh, from underneath four different wings. Can you see this guy? And he's got a, a sword in each hand, and it's a flame of fire of each sword. And then and, and alongside of him, he, that's, that, that's just his b body. His spirit is inside of a wheel, inside of a wheel, that is all full of eyes. And wherever the wheel goes, he goes. And it stands about as high as he stands. And he's saying, you're not messing with the holy things of God. It's called a cherubim or a protector. You're not messing. I destroy you. Because he's, 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 he is stirred with the zeal of the Lord. And he cries, holy is the Lord. Holy is the Lord. Holy is the Lord. No death's messing with my father. No death's messing with my God. 
And that's just one of the, that's one of, just one of the folks in the league that stand around and tremble. While everybody else, just humanity now in this period of time, sorts out, are you demon? Are you a demon? Are you a demon spirit or spirit of the Lord? I'm just telling you now. I'm laying it down out there for you folks in YouTube land. Right here in this church. Who are you? Whose side are you on? Of what spirit are you of? Father's given us the privilege and the grace to be of his spirit. Recreated us anew. Masatalanea. I break down the strongholds of Satan. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Satan, I serve you notice in the name of the living God. You have no rights around here. And against God's house. And against God's people. And against God's servants. We are of the Lord. And it is the Lord who is our defense. Father, we cry out to you. Let your fire fall. Let your glory be made manifest. Let your anointing, oh God, overwhelm the souls, the hearts of every person, every man and woman and boy and girl here not only in this place, oh God, but every house. Let your fire be upon it in this city, in this region, in this county, oh God, in Southern California. Father, I pray, let a firestorm of heaven break off the strongholds of darkness. Father, I pray that such a cry come up from your people. I pray, oh God, that such a cry come up from your people. That it won't be anymore every man to his tent. And every man doing what is right in his own eyes as though there was no king. For truly, Jesus, you are the king of kings. You are the champion. You are the great deliverer. The Father is raised up. Oh, truly, Lord, you be jealous for your church. Truly, Lord, you be jealous for us. For, Lord, your name is jealous. Jealous over your life. Jealous over that which is holy. Jealous over that which is sacred. Jealous over that which is true. Father, you know the voices that try to defy your word. You know, God, the powers that would stand up against the flowing forth of your anointing. The signs and the wonders. You see, oh God, how Satan has easily overthrown the men who would have stand in this place, oh God, in this region. You see, oh God, how Satan's strategy has been effective to stop the advancement of your church, oh God. Father, we pray in Jesus' Jesus name that there would be such a moving of your spirit in our lives oh God that there would be a change to it all oh God that there would be in this time people oh Lord who would be filled with the zeal of the Lord filled oh God with a love for you to honor you Lord filled with the same in a greater zeal that the cherubim would have that your holy name in your holy presence, be not defiled. In your holy house, the temple of the Holy Ghost that you've made each one of us as living stones. Murabasite. Oh God, arise as in the days of old, as in the former ancient generations. Oh, Lord God, when you destroyed and overthrew defiance, Rahab, when you wounded the head of the dragon, oh, God, when you parted the seas so that your people could walk over into the miraculous realm of your demonstrated power in the earth. Do it again, Father, we pray. Arise of God, arise of God. Arise in the midst of us, Lord. Tonight, I'm just calling all of you guys to come and be sanctified with the same sanctification that Jesus himself demonstrated. He said, I'm sanctified that you may be sanctified. Our sanctification is found in him. We are calling you tonight to to step out of sin and darkness and self-interest. And come over with total abandonment and fall upon the rock and be broken. 
And let God cause a brokenness and a humility to so overwhelm your life that a trembling is there as well because it is in there that you will be sensitive to the movings of God. It is there at that point, it is there in that realm that all of a sudden you shall be taken over with such a glory that belongs only to the habitation of the Lord that everything will be redefined for you. Nothing will be the same. I tell you, you listen to me. I don't care how much you know the word. When you step into the presence of God, you, everything is redefined. Ask Job. Ask Isaiah. Everything. Father calls us. He says, come. We must break off the league that we have with anything that's foreign to his presence. Foreign to his way. Foreign to his nature. Foreign to his character. Foreign to the spirit of truth. It is this. This is where every revival, every moving of God always begins. It has to begin with a repentance that says, I renounce the world and all its influences and the spirit of disobedience and the God of this age. And I submit myself wholly to the living God to serve him and him alone. And then with that, we ask God to let his floodlight fall up, shine upon our heart. We ask, this, ask him to let his fire fall upon us. And there he instructs us in a fear, in a holy reverence, in a trembling before him, in an awesome uh, awareness of who he is. Oh, my God, a day. <laughs> Hallelujah. It was not hard for Isaiah to become broken and trembled. All he had to see to tremble, all he had to do is see Father high and lifted up and his glory filling the temple. <laughs> his train, those that accompany him, those that are, high, those that are surround him. <laughs> my, 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 my. And the awesome and the terrible glory of those that surround him. Let us be in the number of those who sit at the table. Let us be in the number of those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. I woke up with this question, and it's a question for every single person in this place. No one is exempt from this question. How much of the church is like the people of Israel? How much of our life is like the people of Israel? How much of it is act and not of the heart? Yeah. God's not so interested in the acts, but he's interested in the heart. Yeah. It wasn't just the rending of the garments that caught the Father's attention and changed his, his heart of what he was planning, his intent of what he had, was going to do in judgment and justice. It was the rending of the heart that caught God's attention. It was the brokenness and the humility before God. Yeah. That was, it was every area of their life, of not just their, their mind and just their act. It was of their heart, every, every fiber of their being given yeah. over to God that said, God, I want to worship you in spirit and in truth. God, take all of my life. Judge my life now. Let your truth reign in my life. Let your justice reign in my life, oh God. Let every time that I come before you, oh God, yeah. be my heart wholly yeah. acceptable before you, Lord Jesus. Father, that this is such a holy and sacred place, oh God. Here is my heart. Here is all of me. Let it be broken before you. He's interested in the heart. And there must be first a breaking before change can come. There must be a breaking before God can once again mend and shape and build you. Yeah. Yes. The church must break. Yeah. The church must break before God. Yeah. 
Let every heart in this place right now break before God so that we can take on the mantle and the anointing that God has for our lives and rise up and be the bride that he's called us to be. Break us, oh God. Break our hearts before you, Lord Jesus. Let there be no act. Oh God. Let there be no act, oh God, but a full breaking of the heart and truth and reality before you, Lord Jesus. Father, we come before you right now. We give everything oh, over God. to you. We give every emotion that we have to you. We give every thought that we have to you, oh God, for you to judge it in your justice, Lord Jesus, and in your truth. Yeah. Father, all of our being, we holy, we give over to you, oh God. Yes, Lord. We continually yes. will come before you, Lord Jesus. We will go the distance to continually follow you, oh God. We will not be caught up in a whim of the excitement of it, oh God, but we will go the distance to continually give our hearts yes. over before yes. you. Yes. Yes. Oh, Jesus. I saw in a vision. I was asking the Father. I said, Father, how can people be in your presence for a thousand years? But when Satan is loose, there be still the host that go away out of your presence and fight with Satan against you. How can this possibly be? And I saw in the vision that there was people, they, they, they did it in Acts. They never fully had the encounter of breaking before God before God to give their hearts over. That there was so many, there's so many people in the church today, they do it in acts, they see, they look around of what they're supposed to do, of what they think it's supposed to look like, or how they're supposed to be, but they never allow their heart to be rent before God and fully given over to Him. And I saw that those are the people that never truly learned how to give their heart fully over to God. True. Were the True. people that were out of, that were offended, that were in True. some way thought God's judgment was too harsh or his authority was too harsh or in some way disagreed with him, True. even though they were in the fullness of his presence. So as soon as Satan was, was, was loosed because all that they had was just acts, they ran to Satan to fight against God. If you do not want to be the person that runs out of the presence of God after being with him for a thousand years to go fight against him, rend your heart right now. Break your heart before God. Yeah. Break it. Break it, oh God. Break it, oh God. Let us be the valiant yes, that stand Lord. with you. That no matter what, oh God, yes, we will Lord. be valiant for you. Yes, we Lord. will stand in your presence and we will be with, you, be with you for all of eternity, oh God. This is our cry, oh God. Yes, Take Lord. our hearts, every piece of our heart, every bit of our heart, oh God. Take it. And let it be holy and pleasing, acceptable before you, Lord Jesus. I just want everybody who wants an encounter with God, who wants to be broken with God, you come to the altar right now as consecration to the Lord Jesus right now. Let your heart be broken before Those are the kinds of things that God would lift up a standard against. And, the fa and he's not going to do it without your participation because unless you're willing to come under the rule of the spirit of holiness, you won't know. You won't understand. But if you're willing to come under the spirit of the holiness, the rule of the holiness spirit, then you're going to tremble. In other words, you're going to be so aware of his glory, so aware of his presence. Hallelujah. Huh. That you'll be his champion. Hey? Because the cherubim trembles. Amen. And it's not a trembling, it's not a trembling under, over anything other than the awesome sacredness of the living God. Should man tremble even more? Should we tremble even more? At the risk of doing something that is evil and, 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 and transgression against him. Should we tremble? Oh yeah, we should tremble. Yes, we should know how to behave ourselves uh, in handling the sacred things of the living God. And then we should also 
understand then how to be our brother's keeper. This is what the Lord says. And I pray, God, I, I just see the Lord raising Jacqueline up with just the spirit of Phineas. And I, you know, I see the spirit of the Lord on little uh, uh, Caleb and, 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 and he's not so little anymore. And Joshi and, and raising them up with a fiery word of truth in their mouth. And I see the spirit of the Lord on, on Deborah to, to cause her to tremble in the presence of the Lord. To be a woman of prophecy and faith and maturity in the Holy Ghost. And I see these things in Josh and Jake and Elijah and Michael and, and, and all these little ones that, that, are being, that are being brought around the camp of the living God. And I, and I, would say, I don't want to leave anybody out. But I'm just going to say, you, parents, you're the one who's deciding whether anybody's going to be left out. Not the prophet of the Lord. Not the man who speaks by the Spirit of the Lord. You're the one. Because then you, you as a parent, must be zealous. To dedicate your child and minister, that your child would minister unto the Lord, even as Hannah dedicated Samuel. You must be jealous to make sure that you're not setting evil things before them. And there is no evil thing like the example of, a, of the parent. For the parent's behavior and action speaks far, more, far, much, far louder and far greater than anything that they would say concerning uh, what they believe about God. For what they believe about God is more fully communicated in the way that they behave. If I function and flow in the anointing, I function and flow in the anointing. And while I'm functioning and flowing in the anointing, I lay my hands on my kids. I walk around in the meeting. I've walked around in the meeting since they were little. And under the anointing, I'll just walk by them and I'll lay my hands on them. And as they're worshiping and I'm worshiping, and under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, I'll go and I'll touch them. I'll lay my hands on them. There's, an anoint, there's a transference of the anointing. There's a connectivity of the Holy Ghost. Parents need to understand how to do this with their, with their families. They need to know how to get in the realms of the anointing. Not in the realms of push and shove and obey me and listen to me right now and you better do it. Because that's just nothing but law. The arm of flesh is going to get nothing but a response of flesh. You know what I'm saying? But when you begin to move in the anointing now. Ha. Hallelujah. And you're caught away over in the realms of the spirit. Now you have authority. Now you can impart something. Now a change comes. It's not some logical sit down, listen to me, let me club you upside the head. Or, be, or belt you one. Uh, de la bon, because the anointing is far more effective than that. Amen. I never spanked my children after, they, after they, when they were 12 years old. After 12, they never received a spanking from me. None of my children. I went into another phase with them. And then before that, we rather minister the, the anointing than the belt. However, the belt does find its proper place when somebody's not listening properly. Amen. Because the Lord chastens His children. He chastens them. He corrects them. But He corrects them in a way to where that, amen, they get, get to change. They get to mature and be acceptable and right. But God doesn't discipline us so we can continue to be wrong. Amen. He disciplines us that we may be right. So I encourage you, parents, I, because I just believe the Lord. I mean, I'm, I'm going to stand here and shout at this mountain until it comes down. So the moving and plans of God through this ministry, the, so they've been delayed. Big deal. And changed nothing about what I'm going to do. And changed nothing about the will of God. Nothing changed. Huh? It just, it just means we've got to wait a little bit longer until the great big excitement happens. Huh. Doesn't matter. We're going to stand here and prophesy to the mountain until it be made a plain. What is this old mountain before you? Well, it's going to be made a plain. Hallelujah. And I'm going to tell you right now. Yeah, I'm going to tell you right now, parents. You got young children? Your spirit and your attitude will have more impact upon them. Your spiritual state and your attitude will have more impact upon them than anything. You can't say, well, I put them in Sunday school and they came out like this. No, they've been in your house. And that's how they came out like that. Are you listening to me? Because now what you do in your behavior it had a, has a dramatic effect on your children. You better listen to me. Because I know countless people who did not listen to me and their children turned out exactly what I said. They did exactly what I said. I told them, I said, I told the parents, I said, you quit your defiance. You quit your attitude. You've grieved the Holy Ghost, and you get right. And they didn't listen to me, and their kids today aren't walking with God. And I told them. 
And I'm going to tell you again, and I will continue to warn people so long as I'm in this tabernacle. There's a right way to do things, and it's a wrong way to do things. And it's not God's fault. Huh? It's parents' fault more than it is anything. It's people's fault. It's wrong decisions. Make right decisions. Make right decisions. Come under the rule of God. Hallelujah. Not by obligation, but because you desperately want to. That's brokenness. And as you do, God will mature his break, brokenness. Isn't it beautiful? He matures humility. Hallelujah. He matures meekness. Oh, you know, He matures it to where you ain't going to move unless God said to do it. Huh? I'm telling you right now, I have many opportunities. I have many opportunities in ministry. I have opportunities in ministry to make more money in ministry if it were money. I have more opportunities to have more people in the congregation if it was congregation. I have opportunities for, for popularity if it was popularity. I don't want nothing except for what God wants. I'd rather sit and minister to the cows. You know what? If that was what the Lord wanted me to do. Minister to one or two people in a field somewhere or whatever. And I'm blessed to be able to minister here in the house of God in the abiding place ministry. I'm telling you, just understand me. What we went through and what we've dealt with here tonight is no patty cake religion program. I, we dealt with and are dealing with the very heart of the thing that stops and prevents revival, that delays revival. And I pray in Jesus' name, every one of you will be able to have wisdom and insight to see it. Amen. Just believe the good word that God has given you. Acknowledge him in such a way that he can manifest himself in your life, that you're aware that he's there. And when you are aware that he is there, let me tell you, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Suddenly, you will have wisdom and insight that will cause you no longer to allow things that are displeasing unto the Lord to exist in your life. Not because you're forced, but because you don't want it. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. If there's anybody you haven't forgiven, forgive them. Forgive them. Does anyone you hold any ought against, release it. If there's anyone you haven't loved like you should be loving them, then give yourself to loving them more. If there's dishonor going on in the house towards mother or father, no matter what they've done, doesn't matter. You honor them in every way that you can. And if they're wanting to walk with the Lord and they're doing everything they can do to please the Lord to the best of their knowledge, then all the more you honor them and disrespect them because ultimately that, that goes over onto the head, the Father, goes to Christ Jesus. It's not just about how you interact with the minister in the house. It's how you act, interact with all God's authorities that represent Him. And there's no authority that represents Father like Mom and Dad. Especially when they mom, a godly mom and dad. And though they've had problems and they've made mistakes and they've not done things properly and maybe they've been, even been bad examples. Then you do, what, you do what's right. You pray for them. You love on them. You don't have to have, don't be guarded. Otherwise, you you protect, own protector and your own your defense. You hear me now? You'd be vulnerable. Hallelujah. You give honor where honor is due. And you give double honor where double honor is due. You know where I give double honor to? Let me tell you where I do. Let me tell you where I give double honor to. I don't care if it's a three-year-old child. When I see the anointing. You won't find me giving double honor. I don't need titles. The anointing. Wherever I sit anointed. Be, and and when when the, the sacred becomes so sacred to you, so wonderful to you, so beautiful to you, so precious to you, you'll get it. 
you'll get more. You get it. When you can't recognize the anointing, when you don't honor the anointing, when you profane the anointing, when you make the anointing common, that means that you have made it sacri- you sacri- you've taken the sacred away from it. You've defiled it, in other words. That's what it means to, take the sa- to do sacrilege or take away the sacred, is to defile it. You're not going to increase in the anointing. It's going to be a threshold. Most people's problem isn't what they think it is. It's actually usually far more simple than that. People make their co- problems very complicated. They're usually not. They're very simple. The things that have kept them from moving forward. <sighs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I love him. I know that he loves me. I'm a dwell. He that dwells in love dwells in God. To know and bl- to know and believe the love that God has for us, God is love. Okay? To know and believe the love that God has for us is where we're, where we're made perfect in love. Okay? But in that love, in ex- expression of that love, and in interaction with that love, I fear and tremble before him, His presence. I fear him because He's awesome. He's overwhelming. Hallelujah. Oh, Rabba Sata. So the, ser- so the seraphim he's so glorious they cover their face they cannot handle it they cover their face crying holy 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 he's so amazing they're just like they're just overwhelmed by the beauty of it the sacredness of it it's just too much it's just too overwhelming can you imagine come on now I say step in you're going to have to say goodbye to the world to step into this realm you have, to, you have to say goodbye to the realms of sin and iniquity and that which defiles and corrupts to step in his holy realm. Satan right now, under his influence of witchcraft, is calling all men to corrupt themselves more, to defile themselves more, to do more wickedly. That's what's going on. That is the spiritual dimension that you see manifested through the Bible and that which is now culminating in these last days. But God is calling us out to come into a place of, that, of the sacred place of life, the the place of purity, the place of holiness, and thus the whole world gives witness to, and all creation gives witness to this reality. Where will you stand? Where will you stand? Where will you stand? To say, well, I just disagree with the Lord is not a good thing. Well, I just disagree it's not a good thing. Just agree with him and walk with him, okay? Just agree with what he said. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God says, call not that which I have cleansed. Common and unclean. You hear me? Hallelujah. God has cleansed you, so call it not common nor unclean. Hallelujah, parousia. Halabasatea kanai. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Pura severity, dear Futura Mansata. I'm going to tell you one more thing. I'll tell you one more thing. You have to understand it in the, in, the, in the context at which it needs to be applied. When the word of the Lord came into the prophet, he said, Turn not to any man, nor speak to them. If men salute you in a way, salute, do not salute them back again. Hey, okay? Just read that, right? Where Elijah appointed his servant to go and anoint Yahoo. Remember? Salute no one. If they wave at you, don't wave back. If they talk to you, don't t- talk back. Say nothing. Because the effect of the anointing can easily be diluted by the conversation with man. There is a place to shut in with God. That every person in Bible days and modern days who walked in this realm of divine glory, my, 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 they've learned how to interact with people. And God wants you to learn how to interact with people without interacting and coming into a realm of humanity but staying over in the glory realm of the Spirit. Speaking by the Spirit. Living by the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit. Being led by the Spirit. 
this is a clean break. This is a lot of transition for you. I'm going to speak some and minister some on it for this Friday night. School of the Spirit. And, you know, people, Satan, are trying to condemn it. Ah, oh, you're trying to be hyper spiritual. And, yeah, well, that's just the slanders of the enemy. I'm saying, living by the Spirit, walking by the Spirit. Hallelujah. Having received an anointing from heaven. I'm telling you, you come around my house, you get in my car, come into church, and you're going to hear nothing but Holy Ghost. You're going to hear God almost You're going to hear praise. You're going to hear, you're going to feel a glory realm because we don't allow nothing else. Why? We're moving in the direction of the Lord to deliver the word of the Lord, to function in the things of the Spirit. Amen. Hallelujah. And we stay there. And then that way, we stay in that realm. And that way, we turn on the television. If there's something that's not inappropriate, inappropriate to watch, you turn it off. And if you stay in this realm, it'll get stronger. It will become stronger, not less. It'll be the Holy Ghost governing you, not you governing you, not law governing you. But the inspiration of God saying, no, 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 this agrees me. You become very sensitive to sounds, to conversation, to whatever circumstance. And the beautiful thing of it is, his Father has given us the authority to bring his presence. Amen? You can't bring his presence to a radio. That's a monologue. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? You can't bring his presence huh, to a television. That's a monologue. Huh? There's no way you can impact that. You're sitting on the other side. Are you with me? But in any other situation in life where, human, where humanity is there, you can change it. You can change the atmosphere. Just change the atmosphere by sitting there. I, you know, if, amen. I'm telling you this truth. If I walk into a coffee shop and I sit down in a coffee shop, I'm going to change the atmosphere there. Just sitting there. Just sitting there. I don't have to do nothing. I don't have to be praying. I know men of God that will go sit there and just under their breath. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, and I'm telling you right now, things stop moving. Things stop moving. But, I mean, you, you, and you can do that however God's going to use you, but I just sit there. Hallelujah. I'm not doing that. I'm just sitting there being quiet in the Lord. And you can change the atmosphere. And, you, and, and then out of that, you know what always shakes out? You know what always shakes out of that? Somebody needs to talk about the Lord. There's somebody. There's an encounter. Always. If you go in there to sip on your coffee and read your newspaper and do your thing, there ain't going to be nothing but you and your paper and whatever else there is. You're minding. Now, I'm telling you about how to move in the things of the Spirit. And the more you move in the Spirit, things of the Spirit, the more you mature in the things of the Spirit. God make us an evangel flame a fire. Hallelujah. And then, and then you're not doing it out of your own strength. I'm going to do it out of the realms of the anointing. Hallelujah. And so are you. Otherwise... You're just going to mature in your own strength, and it's going to be man. It's going to be arm of flesh. It's going to be religion. And the Mormons have done a lot with religion. And the Jehovah's Witnesses have done a lot with religion. And I can talk about denominations. I could tell you about the Roman Catholic Church and all that they've done with religion. Eh? Well, what could we do, though, with the authority of the Holy Ghost that is available to us now? Amen. Well, we'll bring many souls into the kingdom. That's what we'll do with the authority of the Holy Ghost. And not only that, you will be able to see the authority of the Holy Ghost when we pray, when we speak, when we sing. Amen. When we're worshiping, there won't be a sorrowful cloud about our face, but you'll all be as bright and shiny as summer is. Everybody stand with me. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. I just like everybody just come up here for just a minute. Just, just come up here and stand with us, Rob. We love you, buddy. Come just stand with us. All those who are here with us and the thing, all that are we're here with us in the spirit. Just real quickly, I know it's probably getting late. I've been asking the Lord to help me understand how to do <coughs> early church, quick church. <laughs> Father, we just thank you for the anointing of the Holy Ghost that binds us together, that causes us to walk in lowliness and meekness, that causes us, oh God, to submit ourselves one unto another, that causes us to recognize and honor that which you are doing in your house. God, to reverence your holy things. Lord, I pray that every person here will learn how to shut out that which is earthly. 
and shut in with that which is heavenly. For this cause, many people must close their eyes when they pray, for they do not know how to shut out the earthly. Oh, but if whatever it takes to shut out the earthly, to shut in with you. Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that every person in here will have great faith for quick and rapid advancement and maturity in the things of the Spirit. Hallelujah. God, I thank you that there will be a quick and a rap rapid advancement and spiritual demonstration of the power of the Word and the power of signs and wonders and miracles. That every person in here will give themselves to loving and honoring and cherishing the anointing and observing those things which are sacred and giving to them, O oh Lord, the value that you've placed upon them so that they may be the benefactors of that realm of glory. Father, we just pray, O oh God, that everybody in here will gather around and, be pre and count precious those giftings that you've given that everyone around here will gather around the little lambs and count precious the little lambs and take care of them. Amen. And show every, everyone showing you, Lord, that when the little lambs begin to multiply by the tens, they'll be taken care of properly. When they multiply the, by the hundreds, then they'll be taken care of properly. That when they are multiplied by the thousands, then they'll be taken care of properly. Father, we pray in Jesus' name that we will be counted worthy of this vocation, of this calling. We be counted worthy. Hallelujah. That you may fulfill all the good work, all the good pleasure, and all your work of grace in our life. The work of faith in our life. Hallelujah. Now I just tell you in Jesus' name, get filled up. And, you know, when you get filled with the Spirit, when you get filled with the Spirit, what is the response? Huh? The response is a joyful response, isn't it? It's a happy response, isn't it? Singing and making melody. Huh? The psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody. You know, somebody happy singing and making melody. You know, did, did you notice that? Someone sad and sorrowful and worried and concerned. No. There is an authority in brokenness. There's no doubt about it. There are times where we begin to cry out and we have broken. There's a great compassion that takes hold of us. I mean, when, I, when, I, when God allows me to move in the gifts of miracles, I mean, I weep a lot because of the compassion of the Holy Ghost. But I'm going to tell you, this is a beautiful thing. It's a light, a bright and shining light of the Spirit. We have others. It's purpose to manifest through our lives. Just find a bunch of people, hug them, tell them that you love them. Bless them, bless them in Jesus' name.